This looks chill and relaxed, and trust me, it is. It's not a lot of work. We get paid a ton of money for it. Like This is where we make primary income is doing this podcast. So please, don't leave comments. Don't subscribe. Don't share it. Definitely don't leave a review. Don't tell anybody that this is a podcast, and don't tell them to watch. Please, honestly, just stop listening. Stop watching. Don't buy any of our clothes or our guns. Just please don't. This podcast, this makes all the money. Just don't watch. So there's an obscure, little-known uh, American author named Ernest Hemingway who has inspired um, much of my hunting and adventure in my life. Um, and we are so lucky today to have his great-grandson, Patrick Hemingway Adams, here today, who is part of the estate Um that works licensing Hemingway products and it's just an incredibly interesting dude who is also inspired by his family member um, who just recently got back from a hunt with Field Ethos in Africa and um, so we're going to sit down with him talk about all kinds of things uh, Ernest Hemingway hunting in Africa and um, Jay's inability to fly drones so check it out TacticalDistributors.com right now, I'm trying to get more of these Neptune pants, 4.0s. The skinnies or the slims, I don't know what they are, but they, they're sick. So I need more. Unpossible 15 gets you 15% off at checkout. Just go on there, get whatever you want. They have every. You know what else it gets you? What's it get me? Bitches. 15% off, Unpossible 15. Oh, if I could get those for 15% off. You're having Diet Coke today? What, what, what are cola. you? You're like. It's a health nut. Yeah, big well, health guy. Health well, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. not, it's not only that, but it's like it's a different drink every week. Yeah. Like to just be young, like and, mix young and free and wild. <laughs> yeah. Like I know I'll have whatever's in the fridge. Right. I yeah, try to no take preference. the things that I, I try to take the things that I see um, there's an abundance of because I'm like, oh, maybe they don't like that one as much. So don't drink that. my Diet Coke. Oh, there's other shit in there for you because that's what I mix with my bourbon at night when I'm chilling. All right. I won't make that mistake again. I'm going to get one of these. If you guys can find me one for seven hundred or under, let me know. Not a grip, not a this? fucking Griffin and how. Just a, just a. So I just totally. I just bought one. one that's like in the same vein from a, a buddy of mine that kind of needed the money, and mm. but he he had one that's kind of like it's done in the same sort of uh, feel to it, and he swears it's like an apprentice from Griffin and Howe. and it looks good. It looks good. It's close. I don't um, need that. See, I, I, you always wonder. It's but it's like, the budget. It's the budget version. How, yeah, how, I can how, afford that. How do you disprove stuff like that? Well, I don't know. Because well. you can find them. I mean, I've looked on like Gunbroker and stuff, and you can find them for five, six, seven hundred bucks. And I'm then fine. Why don't you just buy one? I thought about. It. I just like I've never bought anything off Gunbroker, and I'm wary of it for no reason whatsoever. But seems to work for millions of people. You're right. I'm gonna go fucking blind here, but the sun will move. It's all right. <laughs> I was just thinking how convenient for your lady if she went blind. <laughs> <laughs> I need those Dave Kramer fucking magpul. Those shades? Where are they? Are there's some in here? No, I'm chilling. Um, I, don't, I don't know. We, we get started late, I guess. There's a different time of year. I don't know what's going yeah. on. Um, anyway. Who is this? Jay. So we're back. Yeah, we are back. Another early episode of season two. Season two. So season two is fucking crushing right now. I know. It is. It's It's been fucking epic already so i really wish we were back in the old green hills of africa i tell you that much and boy are they green boy ernest knew what he was talking about <laughs> he did <laughs> and now we're here in fucking new hampshire yeah. in the winter i think we're about to get snowed on any minute yeah anyhow patrick hemingway adams it is so good to have you special 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 guest today Ooh. oh i'm so excited oh one I feel, I feel special. You, sh- uh, okay, you, should. you should. You got three specials. So I'm going to have some of my Seven Seas beer. It seems fitting. So shout out to them and Mike for sponsoring the podcast and my alcoholism. But also, it seems very fitting for uh, him. Can you just chill? It's just a little <laughs> sunshine. What the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you? All right. I'm chilling. Man up. All right. I'm chilling. Man up. I'm just gonna look Put some of them Wayne the Weber time. shades on and get, get after it. Man, you need something with the brim. I know. Brim. Yeah. 
Yeah. I know. Um, Cowboy hat. Man, I've talked about it so much even on the podcast. Um, as you know, because you, you, you told me you've listened to some. But the once I got into hunting and wanting to go to Africa and, and just everything about Roosevelt's adventures there and your great granddad, Ernest Hemingway's adventures in Africa. Holy shit. Then you go and you spend time there, and I can't wait to talk about your trip you just got back. And then you understand why he wrote books about it. Like, oh, yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter who you are or what you've done. You go spend some time in Africa. It's going to change your life in a, in, a, in a wonderful way somehow. I mean, for him, I don't know, sucked a little bit to get in plane crashes and whatnot. A couple of but them, yeah. Yeah, I had a rough time, but I, yeah. you know, it seemed to work out. Yeah, so go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm stoked just because once, before we were going up, or before we were going to Africa, um, I know in the between the last couple of trips you've had, you kind of dove deep into into Hemingway's books and all that, um, and I I started making the plunge before we went just to kind of like get in the mindset yeah. Yeah, or whatever, get, get in the zone, and it's the best thing I could have done. And like, I'm super thankful that one to just have the opportunity, but two, like, kind of get in that mindset, and then you get there, and there's just the little things that you see, you're like, oh, I read about this or whatever, and that's really cool. Well, I think it's even interesting, and in, in maybe we'll let you speak in a few minutes, but <laughs> about. Um, you know, it's some of the brilliance of his writing and, and, you know, just being widely regarded as, you know, the greatest author that we've had in America, but the subtleties that he notices and can express in such a simple way. And it is it, like you read it. And, and for me, like my reading comprehension sucks. Like I've got executive functioning issues and stuff. And, and, um, his writing, he can tell a story so well without, you know, trying to use words that you got to look up and um, just so expressive and it's so clear and but it is it's what is amazing to me in is just the very subtle things that he notices and can express it's like really what it's about and you go over there and there's so many things that just to be in awe of Africa but it really is like when you think about it and you spend much time up there it's just these subtle differences that make everything better and I don't, I don't really know how to express it, but he did a good job. Yeah, I, I think he, he tried his best to kind of um, characterize, kind of kind of quantify, measure it yeah. som- somehow. Yeah. But it but it was I think it really took him for a ride um, because when he, when he wrote Green Hills, you know that came out and it was kind of kind of like eh, it's semi autobiographical as but it's presented as a novel. But he's the main character. It's kind of it's kind of uh, a different take on it, yeah. but. To go read that now before you go before you go on an African hunt or something and go go into that kind of country, um, it plays really well with your imagination because it's it's not so over the top. He didn't go into excruciating detail about everything, but rather it was one one guy's kind of take on it, and it was simple and accessible enough because um, he was just awestruck. Yeah. So if you you read that, you're kind of like, okay, well. Damn, that's what he was trying to talk about. Was the, was the way that this place made you feel? Um, yeah, it, it is and, interesting because in, in um, well, I actually listened to an audio version before I mm-hmm. went the first time, and then I've read it since, and I've listened to the audio version again. And after you go and you spend time, it makes a lot of sense to you, and yeah. then you understand why these subtle little things made such a huge impact on. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just, you know, for, for example, the physical descriptions, the landscape, you, you read it and you're like, okay, you know, the hills are green or something. But when you, when you stand there on the top of them, looking out at this big expansive thing, um, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. What is, is it for whom the bell tolls at the beginning where he talks about the soldiers walking through like the, the town and down the road? That's, uh, for well arms. Yes, I, well. I mean, I, so it's a reoccurring theme. I think it, it, it ha- <laughs> sees that it makes that observation in a couple different novels. Yeah, um, but kind of the famous description of of the soldiers walking through the town and and the, the really long paragraph that the English professors talk about with all the commas and stuff. That yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- that I mean, yeah, that description. If n- no one's read that, yeah, and it is kind of famous. Everybody tells you to mm-hmm. sort of read that. It's like a couple paragraphs there in the beginning. But how he was able to describe something to like really just using words and you feel like you're there. 
Yeah. I mean, it is pretty amazing just to like, you know, like whatever it is, the dust and just all these different things. So, so when, uh, in preparation for this, you know, I'm catching up on, on the African podcast that you guys have done and the discussions and stuff. Yeah. And I'm rereading Green Hills, actually listening to it this time for mm-hmm. a change of pace. Um, you, I got the same, same kind of feeling because he went and had this experience, this, this life changing experience in Africa. And he came back and he tried to tell everybody what had happened. And to to mixed um, reception, right? Yeah. But it's kind of like what you what you guys have been trying to do. You're like, listen, you got to go here. You have to experience this thing. It's it's hard to explain why, but we're gonna keep trying. That this book was his attempt to do the same thing. Yeah, and and uh, then you didn't have social media or podcasts. So yeah. Like you have this thing. I think, you know, I got really inspired because thinking wh- whether it was you know your great grandfather or roosevelt it's like these were men that by most measures had lived full lives and i've always been adventurous and wanted that in my life and i didn't come from people that you know really go out and seek adventure and do these things and so i was really inspired and you know and i think like them in a lot of ways like i've been very fortunate in my life up until this point Mm -hmm. because i mean yeah you talk about like he he died at what 61 62 yeah so I'm 47. So by the time he was 47, he had accomplished a lot of things as well, had Roosevelt. I mean, I mean, Hemingway, the first time he's in Africa, he's 34, 35. He's a little bit older than I am. Yeah. And he'd already been to war mm-hmm. half a lifetime ago mm-hmm. for him. You know, he'd already experienced yeah, when World he was 17, War. Yeah, when he was 17, World War I. Um, so by, by then, yeah, lived, lived a full measure almost. Yeah, so it's, but to me, I just thought, before I started really going to Africa, that there has to really be something to it. If everyone, like all these famous men that, it, you know, and they're fam- like, you've heard of them for reasons. And, and, and these, the, these are men of means and adventure and have just had full lives. And they go at this point in their life and it changes their life. Like there's gotta be something to it. And, and so I find myself like in a similar situation. Like I don't like, I've gotten to do lots of cool stuff in my life. And I'm very grateful, you know, and it's in, in a situation in my life now at 47. It's it's like I was excited when I got the Tesla, for instance. And the Tesla changed my life in some ways. But I'm over it in like two weeks. It's still like the greatest car I've ever had. It's so fun to it's, drive. Well, every that time that you change get in still it. happened to you. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but every time I get in, I'm like, holy fuck, this car is awesome. But it's like, it's not life changing. You, you know, and it's a thing. Uh, but Africa it is. And, and it's like, I always say, I get nothing out of it other than like, I feel inspired to tell you, if you have the ability to go, you should go. It will change you for the better yeah. in so many ways. And it's like reignited something in me where I, I couldn't wait to get home to see my loved ones. And the next day I couldn't wait to get back. And you know, and I don't know, like you could, like Yellowstone is incredible. And I understand why Roosevelt fell in love and, you know, it's like this great national treasure and park. I've been several times. It's cool if I never go back. I think it was a lot nicer when he was there than it is now. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. They had trees back then. Yeah. There's no trees now. And, but I mean, this is just a, a totally different thing. So you, you just went on. So you had been before. Yeah, to Africa. You when know, you were never, never hunting, but I, I've been to some of the eastern countries. Um, I've got family from out there, and uh, you yeah, diff- your granddad lived there. Yep, my granddad lived there, and my parents grew up um, in East Africa. Um, so I'd, I'd been out there seeing family, hanging it, but doing the kind of the cultural stuff. Not, I was never in the bush. I was in cities, you know, or suburbs. Um, yeah. So when I went to South Africa this fall, it first time in South Africa. And you um, went with Field Ethos. And I, with yeah, Jason all and those, those scandals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're um, a good time. So they, they, they invited me along um, to, to go check this out and have this experience. And, um, you know, when it, uh, it was a big deal for me because my whole life I wanted to go do the hunting part. Yeah. Um, I had, you know, um, I was growing up as this punk kid in South Florida and I'm hiding like Peter Capstick books under my desk and reading them in class and um, getting, you know, I, I had all these, I had African hunting tattoos. I was, I was ready to go. I was going to split town when I graduated oh, high school and, and go do kid. an apprenticeship and never come back. Um, yeah, and your granddad pH there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I want I wanted to go do that. I wanted to, uh, escape civilization some, somehow and, yeah. and go, go live this mythical life that I was reading about. And these guys, um, 
in the and Hemingway and Capstick and Salou and all all these guys. Yeah. Um, and uh, it didn't quite work out, but it was something I held. You know, I I kept that ember growing. Um, yeah. Jason Vincent figured that out and tricked me into going with him. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and um and so knowing all that stuff, no, you know, a lifetime of preparation for it, reading books, watching movies, all all this stuff. Think meditating on it, and you show up there, and it's still blow your hair back. Yeah, you Amazing. can't prepare for you, it. it. It just shocked. So I, I brought a, st- um, cause I, I knew I was going to write about it or I wanted to try to write about it. Cause I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out how to be a writer. And, um, so I wanted to try to, um, memorialize what I was thinking about this stuff as it was happening. So I brought, I brought books. Um, so I, I brought the true at first light, which was kind of the second, um, Hemingway work on Africa when he went back, um, about his t- uh, trip in the fifties. Oh, I've not even read it. And I get you get you one of those. But I, so I was reading about that, and I had um, I had uh, one of Salou's books too. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, but it was about him going back because he, he he had gone to England for a while. And it's when yeah. he returned in the eighteen eighties. Um, so I'm reading these things on the plane, and Ernest is talking about going to Africa, and it's it's now ruined when he goes back in the 50, <laughs> in the fifties. He's like, you know what? Actually, don't bother because it's it's never as special as it was. Don't don't bother coming back. N- not really like that, but he was disappointed because it wasn't like his first trip. And then Salou's book, he's talking about, oh yeah, Africa's ruined. Everybody's coming here. The, it, it's not the same as it was. And it's like 1880, 82 when he's writing this. Oh, oh, that early. Yeah. So I'm, I'm there. I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm decades and decades later here. And I go, no, actually, I think these guys got it wrong. There's still special places out here, and I wasn't prepared for that. I thought I was going to show up, and it was going to be oh, like, like, like all commercial. Yeah, it was going to be ruined. I kind of missed the boat because I wasn't born a hundred years earlier or something like that. But, but it wasn't the case. It was actually, I don't think I could have had a more pure experience um, out there in that part of the world than I had, oh, and I didn't so know that incredible. was possible. That it was still there. Well, I, I mean, okay. So I want to interrupt as usual. Um, I, I will say this: I, you know, being inspired by. Roosevelt's story, you know, and his son, I think his son Kermit spent like eight years in Africa. But, you know, everything was different then. So I expected it to be different. But my first couple of trips and adventures to Africa, it was more commercialized than I thought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because there's a lot of high fence hunting and stuff in Africa. And like, I'm okay with any kind of hunting, but it, it, I didn't even realize it, but it wasn't the experience I was looking for. But I always hear this stuff, then I expect it to be a little different. But what's the most I can get out of it? But now I do find, I think where I fell in love with Crusader and free-range hunting there and just the vastness of the property that they have and stuff is it's probably the closest thing I can get to when it was really free and, you know, like all the stories that were written in the 1800s about people hunting in Africa and seeing Africa for the first time. Yeah, I mean... I, I, some of that would be great to be able to experience it back then, but also like like modern convenience. It's cool to take an airplane well, over well, there. It's like short short of doing like a you know a six month like oxen backcountry Africa hunt yeah. on foot. It I don't know how Crusader could be b- much closer to the to this authentic experience. Yeah, it's, because I mean they'll give you whatever you want, yeah. and you can have like the most difficult authentic mm-hmm. experience you want. Or, you know, they can accommodate you if if you're not as mobile as you once were. I mean, there's, but I, I do love, it, and I've been fortunate to hunt so much now and for so long. Um, you know, now it's, it, it's, it's like that, I want that, the most authentic experience that I can have. And, you know, I get that there. And, and I mean, that speaks to me way more than hunting. I mean, it's ruined hunting for me in most other places of the world, not just America. Um, but the idea of hunting, like preparing all year and there is something special about that though. And, and having a season and you go after one particular animal and you're successful or you're not, um, that's great. But I love the idea of Africa when you set out in the morning. Um, I like to let it come to me. So there, there, there's, you know, if I'm hunting a lion, that's one thing. And that requires, that's a very difficult hunt. If you're hunting free range, not a pin raised mm-hmm. lion. Um, if you're hunting wild lion and just that whole experience is very difficult, but you know, like the sidebar of, you, you, okay, well we've got to shoot some stuff cause we've got to get bait to feed the lions. And 
or whatever. But when I set out in the morning, it's very rare that I have a particular goal because what I found at a, in Africa and at Crusader and where it's different than hunting here or in, you know, in America or other places is you have no fucking idea what can happen and what yeah. can come to you if you just let it. And the greatest experiences or at least most of them that I've had in Africa, we set out in the morning and we just set out for adventure and what happens happens and it unfolds the way it does. And that's a great thing about being actually in the wild. Like it, it, that's, that's kind of like the last place that that happens yeah. that you can just invite adventure into your life. Yeah. Right. Cause it's yeah. like, you can like literally shoot things in self-defense in Africa and boy, that challenges you in a lot of ways. And, and it just like really evokes this, this, you know, my love of adventure. Like, I don't need to know what's going to happen today. You know, what I do know is I have confidence in my pH. I have confidence in my equipment. And let's get out there and see what happens. And you, you know, what I was really taken by, too, was was uh, you're unsupervised, pre- pretty much. And, <laughs> and um, you know, li- living in the States and things, you kind of forget what that is like. To, yeah, we think we're free here. Y- yeah, we They're think we're freer. I there. mean, I I live on top of a mountain in Montana, you know, close to town, but I, c- I can kind of do what I want. I can get up to some stuff. But That's what Randy Weaver thought. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, he thought he got away, didn't he? Um, so I'm um, I'm up there, and um, but you go you go to this South Africa, you go so far into the rural country there, and you realize that there's there's nobody around except your friends, and and you know some other folks, and there's. There's nobody to come help you. Mm-mm. So you kind of like, um, that's empowering, I think, to take that on. Well, I you think know? for some people it would be horrifying. Yeah, it's, not, know, it's like not for everybody. People that believe no. the government are always going to save them. Uh, well, I mean, even even at a small scale, like um, when we were up there, we were with Nick and Guy, and we were going down, Nick had shot a wildebeest in a canyon. Basically, we had to go straight down this kind of a cliff face. And everything, everyone was quiet. And Guy just stopped and turned around and told Nick, he said, don't fall here. He's like, the the hospital's very far and it's very bad. <laughs> and like, yeah. you, you then you look around and you go, oh, yeah, no. Well, there's, yeah, the, it, you're it, screwed. There, there's not guardrails. And <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. no. I mean, it <laughs> is. I mean, if you want to go over there, I, I mean, that's, I think, kind of the wonderful thing about it is you can get whatever you want out of going on adventures in Africa and – To a point to, I think, where, I I mean, to me, I think I've said for a long time, I think, like, World War II was, like, the pinnacle of America, and we've kind of been, you know. Our most industrious. And and America has not been as good ever since, and we just continue to fuck it up. But, you you know, it's, it's like, oh, God, you know, something happens here, you call the police, they're here in two minutes, like. And I think a lot of people want that, or you think you need that. It's like the government's going to come save you. But, yeah, I mean, being out there, it's like you said. It's like, hey, we're hours. Like, even with um, calling a helicopter in to get you, you're an hour and a half, two hours if you get hurt from getting to a hospital. Like, if you get mm-hmm. bit by a cobra, like, you are going to die. Yeah. Like, that, and that it's it's interesting how that affects your behavior, the, w- the way you act out there. No, like, knowing that. So, in some ways, it makes you, like, a little less reckless, a little more cautious. And I also found that it makes you almost more reckless because it's you're now you're flaunting it in the face of fate, right? Um, huh. So I, so before I was I was like, okay, it. there's no help, there's no there's no medical care, there's no you know there's no ambulances, you know you can't even get airlifted unless you're really you know really connected. Um, so I was like, okay, I better be careful. I was like, I don't know, it's almost more fun to be be a little more wild out here. Uh, but I'm I'm a little like I'm a little it. twisted. No, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I kind of like that part of it, but you know what I find with me, if I think a lot about it, and, and there is, you know, like, one thing I don't like about America is you can't starve to death here. Like, the government's going to save you. Mm-hmm. I I don't like that. And I, I, I think it, um, there's nothing about it I like. You know, but it is hard. Like, nobody ever wants to see children suffer, and that's probably a big root of us becoming so weak as a society in general, and so you get used to having a safety net. Yeah. yeah. And I think being over there, what I noticed is I am very grateful for anyone that serves me in any capacity. So all the staff there that's helping us doing anything. And I think it's just natural being in that environment. I'm exceptionally gracious and thankful for what they're doing. 
And then it's like also like I'm not going to take a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. You yeah. know, so I mean, there is this part of the ego and and, and I, I don't really know quite how to describe it, but I think I'm definitely different there than I am here. And I think it's just natural like here, you know, like we have so much fucking government now. And sometimes like you don't understand it. Go to a place like we're talking about where there are no police there. Mm-hmm. There is nothing no, where we own, are. There is own police. no yeah. government out there. Like no one's going to help you, save you. You are on your own. And and here it's like always, a, um, you know, kind of a fallback. It's always in the back of your mind. It's like, you know, and to me living in this house, I pay so much in property tax. And it's like, if something happens, like I want to call the police, like, like I have to give so much money to the government in this town every year. Like, come don't, do your don't they work job. for me? Yeah. 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 <laughs> like I get that, you know, fucking asshole attitude. But I mean, in reality, what I want is I want to provide my share and I want you to stay the fuck out of my life. And if I have this big chunk of land, like, you know, it, yeah, it, just it, let it, me do what I want. On it, it is yeah. interesting here. And I was thinking about, OK, so I had this big farm in Georgia and for 10 years I'm planting, feeding, trying to grow a big, healthy deer population. And so but I can only even cull animals, whether there's an injured one or whatever, legally three months out of the year. And that's asinine. If it's my property, I care for this herd and want it to be sustained and I want to grow it and them to be healthier. And I love seeing deer every day. Like, why should the government tell me if there is an injured or a sick deer and it's July and it's not deer season that I can't shoot it? Like, fuck you. Like, I, I just, you go to Africa, it's not that way. Like, there aren't seasons on the animals there. And they, it's such an abundance of animals. But, like, Crusader, for instance, like this family that settled this part of South Africa, and the whole family, there's millions of acres. And it's like, you're just responsible. You, you, when they're you, proactively managing their herds. Um, you know, fostering diversity, all, all, all of the, it's so, it's so thoughtful yeah. what, what they've done. And you look at it and, and they're go, able to do it without the government. No government could ever do it this efficiently. No, you, because you know. to them, what's in their best interest? That they have a sustainable, healthy population of animals on their property all the time. Mm-hmm. And that means you have to shoot some, which is great for them because then they get to sell hunts and have people there and do all that. And that means you got to feed them, take care of them, manage them. You yeah. know, plant for them, provide, you know, vegetation. And if you got, like, too many giraffes and, you know, there's not enough food, you call some of them. Like, that's just what you do. And and I, I think to your to your earlier point, what I think is so cool is how that, that environment that we're trying to describe, this the situation, that those, it creates interesting people um, yeah. and, and interesting oh. characters, right, <laughs> are, are emerge from, from that <laughs> environment um, who, who are, you know, they're self-sufficient, they're um they're uninhibited um yeah. and and they're they're smart and they're savvy and they're industrious and and um i was really impressed with with the south african people really Just yeah w- what they could do what they were capable of where where i think american people would say ah man i, I don't know i'm gonna ask for help or that's just beyond my abilities there wasn't anything that they couldn't figure out yeah, you, you know, I, um, I feel so at home there. But yeah, like, like what you're saying, if we're all there and something happens and we need to do something, it's not a because here it's like, oh, you know, something happens at the house. Like, I don't like working on stuff and doing stuff here. It's like, you know, e- either my assistant or Ivanka, you know, like call, you know, whoever. But there it's like something goes wrong plumbing wise or whatever. It's like, hey, guys, we got to fix this yeah, right and now. They just go figure it out. Yeah, we just came, do it. We yeah. came back from lunch after guys brakes went out while we we're on a hill. And the guy, um, the the legendary <laughs> PH. Yeah. And, and I mean, before we went back out, his truck was fixed. Like everyone helped pitched in. They pulled apart the truck, yeah. fixed it and got. And yeah. there was no like, well, you're what should two we do? Uh, you're two hours from a Toyota dealership. Right. Yeah. yeah. There was no even yeah. thought of like, oh, well. Maybe tomorrow we'll bring it in. It was just like a, hey, let's just fix it and then Every, we'll go yeah, back. Up. Everything has to work. Yeah, it has to, has to work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you just uh, have to. That's we we had a one of our hunting companions had a, uh, a emergent hemorrhoid situation. Oh, we were really? In camp. Yeah, and it bec- because of the nature oh. of of uh, the group, I guess that was shared with everybody. We had to talk. <laughs> so it was the talk of the t- talk of the town, right? I haven't when, heard this story. Oh yet. man! Oh. And so, um, because we were so inspired by by the South African people and their resilience and their and their creativity, we decided we were going to solve this. You're going to cut it off. Well, we're, we you know we had to lance it. <laughs> oh fuck! We yeah. we felt 
Right. We, we, um, <laughs> like, this we, is the best. Thing we were do. inspired to <laughs> step okay, up. So if you, this you know, happens to me, I'm not telling anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so we, you know, we kind of surround him. We pin him. In. He's like, "You guys are not. You're not coming near me." And and we're like, "Well, you want to go to South African Hospital?" Well, there's six of us, and you yeah, know, we're yeah. We, you know we're like we're like you know go go pour vodka on that steak knife. We're gonna get this sorted out. And you know, between the group, we had about as much medical knowledge as, as a Navy corpsman. Yeah, it's like probably. And well, you did have the internet. <laughs> yeah, well, well, like I said, we we were fired up. Um, we we didn't end up doing it, but but there was fired a time up means <laughs> drunk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, Jesus, uh, I would have gotten my gun. At, at, at a certain point, it was like, hey, clear the table. We're we're gonna do this, and then he, he's like, no, 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 no. Um, and so, um, but the South Africans, they're very accommodating people. They're very hospitable. So they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll call. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. we know a veterinarian down the road. We're going to call her and we'll get a little, you know, uh, a little input. I would have been like, yes, bring her. Or no, it wasn't, it wasn't a veterinarian. I think, I think it was JJ's wife. Oh, was, she's, was a doctor. she's a doctor. She's like yeah. an ER. She's an doctor. Actual, doctor. Yeah, she's a doctor. Yeah, so, so we're like, it's okay. We got on speakerphone. Yeah. She's going to walk us through it. <laughs> yeah. And um, we, did, we didn't end up doing it. I, I think we found, maybe lost interest or we got distracted doing something else. But we didn't do it. And later on... Uh, oh, it would have been a gunfight if it had been me. <laughs> yeah, it could have gotten ugly. But Ron, Ron Dan, it was really his fault. He was kind of leading the charge I could there. see that. Yeah. and Because he, he looks trustworthy. Well, he right? looks like yeah. he would play a foreign he's doctor got good, on TV. He's, <laughs> he's <laughs> he got good bedside manner. <laughs> he um, does. But I, I saw him after the trip, and he's like, hey, man, actually, I got home, and I started Googling that. We're really lucky we didn't lance that hemorrhoid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we probably would have killed him. <laughs> Oh, and I, I just said, maybe. Man. Might have, you know. But yeah, you're right. You do get inspired. Kuda probably cleared the table off for you. Kuda. Yeah. 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 Um, he would have he let, left a little. Bring you right, some yeah. appetizers. <laughs> yeah. Or that juice with the. The, the tang. Yeah. The yeah. off brand oh, tang. So yeah. good, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's right. So so your group with Phil Ethos and Cole Hauser from um, the Yellowstone, Yellowstone yep. show. Went, yep. Yeah, but uh, Ron Dan, who's been on the podcast with his best fan friend brett brett was uh, there I think. what's brett's last name for he's for he's yeah yep. so he's the ceo of tour so they were there when you guys got there yeah that's right i met them in in uh in camp when we came Crusaders back there's a good time running. man um that's where i met those guys for the first oh, time you never is. know who you're gonna run into out there because that's in. weird because you go to africa to meet ron dan who lives in the same town as you yeah yeah so that was funny yeah, yeah he's like where do you live i'm like bozeman he's like oh, okay maybe we have a lot of common he's like what's your favorite pop book Pop punk band. I'm like I, I don't know, Ron Dan. <laughs> <laughs> pop punk. Band. Yeah, that's a thing. Pop punk. Yeah. You heard of this, Thomas? What's pop punk? Is that like Joan Jett? No. What no. is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, so we so we got into that. Wait. We started having this discussion around the fire in Africa. Educate you just, me. You just, I want to know. Well, like oh, they man. say that, like the the originators of pop punk were like the Blinks, the. Uh, well, I don't want to go on that. But like Blink-22 was like, they're, they're trying to oh, blame, yeah, blame yeah. them okay, for the so origin like of... Green Day and stuff. Sort of. Yeah, Maybe. they get... I mean, they get well, yeah, lumped in well, with I, it. I but guess so what we... That's the conversation we end up having is, like, well, what do you mean by pop punk? Because mm. you got different subgenres. You got this early stuff, the the kind of bubblegum... Uh, you, you know, we, we used to think of it as like kind of radio safe kind of mm. punk oh, rock kind of yeah. stuff. A, li- a little lighthearted. You know, it wasn't political anymore. Um, of course, all that gets blurred. And then we talk about second wave, like mm. like emo stuff. and, and uh, Emo. Like I said, I, I came to, to Africa. I thought we were going to have all these, like, you know, spiritual experiences, and I did. But I also end up, like, talking about hemorrhoids and pop punk and stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that's part of the adventure, though. Yeah. Like, realistically. I, yeah. I mean, the idea that we're... Where the fuck's this day gonna take us? Like, let's just get in the back seat and go for a yeah. ride. Like, yeah. I'm I'm totally cool with that. Yeah, if, but you're, I, if you're open to adventure, I, I can right. see where, like, my father, for instance, no way in hell Africa would be okay with him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's got to control the whole deal. And for me, I just like I figure I'm gonna be okay. Like, if there's a bunch yeah. of people, I'm probably gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna be the first one to tap out. So I can't like, imagine. Right. Like, I'm trying to think about. Because we bounced around with all the different pHs and everything. I'm trying to think of what. Oh, you and Thomas. Yeah, you guys had a unique experience right. to all of us because you did. You, right. you got to like be a voyeur in all of them. Right. And I, sitting here now with you kind of just saying what you said, like I'm trying to imagine what a control freak, how they would be I've in that scenario. I've seen some in those camps really? before. You'd, you'd spin out. And the right? pHs hate them and want to kill them. Right. And smile and try to get them whatever they want done and get them the fuck out of camp as yeah. soon as possible. I Which just, I, I th- I'm, I'm sure it's not my looks. It's like the, you know, I'm a good time for the PHs because yeah. I'm just there to participate and have a good time, and yeah. I'll pay well, the bill. That was the cool thing that I saw 
with our group is that one, everyone there on our end is game for whatever. Anything yeah. you want to do, we're down. Yeah, it's even a good, good way to be. Even, even Jose. Jose. Yeah. And then the pH is too. There's no certainty in really anything. It's just like a you'll be on a ridge and you'll see something you might want to go after and you go, are we going to go over there? Over there? And they're going to go, we're going to try. Like, we may not even make it well, over Well, it is else. funny hearing them talk. They'll say, like, oh, what are some of your worst? You know, you start drinking around the fire, same sort of thing. It's like, hey, what are some of your worst experiences with clients? It's like, oh, you know, and some of them have, like, crazy fucking stories. It usually involves, like, Russian or Chinese clients. But, you know, the average thing is, like, yeah, we get some asshole rich American comes over. It's like, today I want to shoot a cheetah. Tomorrow I want to yeah. shoot a kudu. You know, yeah. it's yeah. like I want to yeah, shoot a 60-inch kudu. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when yeah, when I was kind of you're pre- gonna have a worse time. Yeah, when, when I was preparing for the trip, I knew I was gonna go and and um, talking to everybody about it. Uh, a lot of people would ask me, "Well, what's what's on your list? What's your wish list? Like, what do you what do you want to hunt? What species? What yeah. what do you have to do?" And I'm like, "Man, I I've been thinking about this my whole life, and I still can't answer that question. Yeah. I, I I have a, a number of things I'd like to try, but I I don't know. I hadn't before I went on that trip. I hadn't seen most of these animals in the wild before. I, I think if you go to some other outfitters I've been to before, you need to kind of know what you're going to do yeah. because I think they'll lead you down a path to spend more money or something they want shot. Whatever the thing is, I think with Crusader you can go there with I think my mentality of kind of an open mind or whatever. Because with what you're saying. Generally, when I go, if we're testing something and I know I need to shoot Cape Buffalo because we're testing eight mm-hmm. six, it's okay. Um, but when I when, when I took um, the engineers recently and and Thomas and Jay went, I gave them a budget and told them what I would pay for that they could shoot, and we had a list of stuff. We got to call a lot of animals, but I told them it it, it was like no matter what, unless you guys don't want to, I think you should really hunt and try to shoot a kudu. Yeah. Like to me, that's something that just personifies hunting in Africa and, and you guys should do it. And it's a wonderful hunt. If you don't want to fine, but please do this. And it just turned out cool. Cause the engineers actually shot all of theirs on the same day, like randomly, like you couldn't script that. And those stories to those kudu, like that, if you ask any of them, and I don't even think it was because of the animal, but it was the hunt itself. They were, it was all of their favorite hunts. Great go. Like that man. was exactly. I mean, so I wouldn't give somebody that same advice. No, the, no, your advice is good. My advice of like just just go easy. Now I know, having done it, what what the things I'd do again, or what I'd tell somebody to do. And kudu, hundred percent, is at the top of that mm-hmm. list. Um, yeah, I, because if you're having yeah. a relaxed hunt, and but you sometimes <clears throat> you can be hunting and you turn a corner and there's a kudu fifty yards from you that's a mature kudu and you shoot him and. <clears throat> that's that's rare, but that can happen. But if you set out, it's the one thing where I think you set out to hunt it. You know, they live in certain areas and stuff, and it typically is a difficult hunt and requires a lot of elements that maybe if you're just having a relaxed hunt don't require. But it's the most satisfying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, my the uh, John Forsyth took me to get on a kudu, and um, we we spotted him from you know, a mile and a half off on, yeah. on a hilltop and, uh, and, and drove out to him and they were on, th- on the top of one of these finger mountains. Um, so we parked at the bottom of the drainage. We had to hike up the whole drainage. The yeah. Whole so damn John mountain. is, uh, let me interrupt you. It's, yeah. So John is, is, uh, about the sweetest dude in the entire Stop. world. And he's a, a PH a crusader. So a professional hunter and he's your guide. And, um, but John is small and very fit. Yes, he, is. <laughs> and he, oh, and he, he enjoys. He, he's walking. like a mountain goat. Man. See, Rad yeah. would say, "Let's go to the top and, and hike down." down. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, John. and so, so that's what was was cool, you know. Um, and it was like in the in the evening, we had to get up there fast, and um, yeah. we're following. We're we're in thick cover in this drainage, hiking up these rocks, and he he's just a billy goat, you oh, know, yeah. stomping around. I got I got John Hill under, with me, <laughs> and um, and we're we're huffing and puffing, but um, we got. Uh, they they moved or we moved or we moved in the wrong direction, but we uh, we were trying to get up on the other side of the drainage to look straight across to get a, to get a shot on this kudu, and there was a little a little bachelor herd of bulls that we were chasing, and uh, somewhere we got we got mixed up and we ended up right below them on the same side of the drainage because um, I, I guess we're not we're not very smart or something. But well, but I, I mean, <laughs> it, you set out doing that stuff and you got a twenty five percent chance at best. Well, any, any anything can happen, so we end up right. like below them. We got to wait, and um, then you hear that, and then the cows come in, 
and I'm I'm like, man, I've only seen kudus like from from afar yeah. at, at this point. Now they're they're from across the room from me oh, in the shit. in the thick trees, and we're below them hiding. Going, oh shit, we got too close. And you hear those cows so start fun. they start barking. That's I didn't know weird. That. It's, it's a super you know weird they're like sound. doing like the DMX like oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, and, um, and shaking the trees like it's like a troll living in there. And we're right right below it holding our guns, and we you know go across and. Um, a run up on a boulder and then they kind of spook and then one stops and looks and, and um, you know, John, John tells me to shoot, shoot this kudu and I'm in, you know, it, just over a hundred yards or something, but straight yeah. across the drainage. So it looks closer. Yeah. And my whole scope well, is hun- full hun- of that kudu. They're b- big animals. Yeah. So a hundred yards is, is, yeah. And it's hard to get close to them. Like that's mm-hmm. very close on a, in, oh, 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 Mr. Oh, Wonderful. He's down. Like I said, well, it was by he accident. Just died too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was only by accident we got so close. Yeah. And so I shot my first kudu like um with um I don't know, it was thirty out six, but I shot him in front. He was looking me in the eyes, mm-hmm. you know, um, filling the whole scope. Uh that's crazy. That's close. Crazy, crazy, crazy <laughs> close. Um, you know, and they're they're good size animals. Um yeah. it, it's one it it's yeah, it's one of the animals where there's typically not ground shrinkage. Like the animal's bigger than you think yeah, in every yeah. regard. You get up closer. and they, I thought they'd be like an elk. They're a little bit bigger than an elk, at least that um, the ones oh, we were looking well, at. Yeah, I mean, to me, elk's yeah. a giant animal too. But yeah, kudu, yeah, that kudu or, or yeah, uh, uh, elk, a bull elk's probably like a kudu cow or something. Mm. And so so the, the kudu was significant to me because my granddad, who, who was a PH, um, when he came back to the States, he brought, he's got this giant Namibian greater kudu, um, shoulder mount. And so his house in Montana, I've grown up under this giant kudu mount on the wall. And, uh, that's what, as a kid, I got kind of interested in hunting because I grew up under these trophies, looking at them. And um, it is the most beautiful animal. And, oh my and God. it doesn't look like it's from this planet. No. It, it looks yeah. like it's from as Martian animal or You're something. You're right. It kind of looks like that. Um, what was that? Oh, geez. Now I lost it. The movie with the blue people, sort of. Blue Man Group. Yeah, that one. Avatar. Avatar. Yeah, Mars Attacks. Yeah, it does look <laughs> like something that would be in, yeah, from one yeah, of those it's, movies it's, or something. It's mythical. Yeah, it, um, it, it does seem like so, that. Yeah. Um, you think no, Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> you just love the Blue Man Group. I mean, you guys are just all about, you know, performing in groups and yeah. men. Painting and each blue. other. Blue, yeah. <laughs> but, so... Um, the kudu was a significant experience for me because that that was a full circle kind of kind of thing. I wanted to shoot a kudu yeah. because that to me, uh, I, I began to understand would kind of epitomize the African hunting experience. And I was like, in that day, I, you know, we we were elated. We're jumping up and down, um, and carried that thing down the mountain. But um, I told John Forsyth, I'm like, this is the most fun day of hunting I've had in my life. And it, it's it's hard to and it was the to first people. time I said it that week. Mm. You know, and then I said it like every day after, <laughs> yeah. after that. But um, but I think it is one of those things. I I, I don't know. I know like I was I was really and I probably pressured the engineers. But I'm like, out of all the things I've done, you guys should. I don't care how much money you spent. Shoot a kudu. I've got you. If you want, and they all. It, you're right. It's like all of their hunts. It was the most epic hunt for all right. of them. And I don't. know, There is something. It, it's it's almost magical about kudu in yeah. Africa and hunting them. Yeah. Well, well, okay. So your granddad was Patrick, who you're named after. That's right. And he's the son of Ernest. Well, how did did he get to Africa and was a PH like because of his father? Like how how um, how did all that transpire? He uh, he grew up in the states. Yep. Well, well, um, in in the house in Key West, he he grew up there. Um, and then later on went to went to boarding school and stuff. So he'd come back and visit his dad in Cuba, and and so he knew. His dad had gone on this trip. His dad was obsessed with Africa. Yeah. Um, so what? Yeah, because I think he has a kudu in that house in Cuba. Maybe. Is uh, there a yeah, I, I think there? I think that's where the kudu ended up. I think is is still yeah. in Cuba. But um, he, my granddad, ended up telling. Him, side note that his dad had a trophy. Um, it, I think it was a wildebeest that he hung in the boy's bedroom in the Key West house oh, after yeah. that trip. So little Patrick grew up looking at that trophy hanging on the wall and got interested in hunting. Um, okay. so, and so he, uh, I don't know, he's, he's a young man. He gets a, gets a young bride and they go to, um, Kenya to start a dairy farm. And it's, and it's in the early, early fifties. Um, but why in the world did they do that? I think it was kind of, he wanted to get away from his dad's kind of, um, 
not shadow so much, but like you couldn't go anywhere without being the son of Ernest Hemingway at that time because Ernest Hemingway was a rock star yeah, in yeah. late late forties, early fifties. Very famous, yeah. um, especially in the circles they were running in. So he in um, Pat's nickname was Mouse. You know, he he was a quiet guy. He was kind of like a, like a mathematician in in personality. Yeah, I've seen lots of interviews with him because yeah. he, he's like the only one still surviving. That's right, right. Of the kids and and so he's in Montana now and he's in his nineties, ninety three. Yeah. So yeah. So so all the interviews and stuff I've seen on YouTube are the stories about Hemingway. He yeah, he's the only one. Yeah. Um. The only around, and he's just kind of a studious kind of kind of yeah. quiet guy. But so he ends up there, and he doesn't want to get mixed up with the Mau Mau emergency that's happening in Kenya at no. the time. So they kind of they they um, filter down to Tanzania or British East Africa at the time, and um, he starts looking for work and about the only job you can get as a white man there if you're not a landowner is, is uh, an apprentice professional hunter um so he went to work with uh um a guy named bunny allen who who was a famous professional hunter at that time you know a uh, playboy womanizing oh yeah one of those the, the, the good old days of yeah. that stuff so so he gets into that job falls into that line of work um and, and had he hunted before spent time yeah, hunting? He yeah he, he so he grew a lot of a lot of wing shooting a lot yeah. of shotguns and birds um growing up um little bit of big game um, in, in Idaho and Wyoming. He'd been on some of those trips with yeah. his dad in, in the early days. So it uh, wasn't a stretch. He was a good hunter. He, he liked doing it, so he stuck with it for a couple of couple of decades. So he was over there that long. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I guess about 20-something 20, 20 years um, when, um, when Tanzania got their independence from, um, gosh, I'm, mixed, I'm a little hungover, Germany or, or England when they, yeah. when they changed over. Um, he went to work for the government training the game rangers and um for their uh oh. they had like an e- ecological college and they trained so the fun. new f- new uh, first wave of game rangers that would work for the country yeah. um so they teach them um conservation game management um they do the elephant culling he pretty t- great he, life himself pretty, pretty and it's the wild west you know it's east africa in the 60s yeah um so you kind of do he lived in a place called moshi which is the um like the base camp for all the Kilimanjaro expeditions, oh, that little village yeah, there. So, so in a beautiful place. Mm-hmm. And so he's calling elephants. And stuff. Yeah. He, um, he told me, you know, f- when they work with the government, they do about 3000 elephant a year. See, it seems ridiculous. People don't understand now in America, like there's probably a hundred or 200,000 elephants in Southern Africa that need to be called. Mm-hmm. Like they're a problem now. Yeah. It's in, yeah. I mean, even back then you, you had, um, so modern medicine is really catching on. In, in the 60s. So population starting to explode. You got a lot of new construction. You know, it's an industrious age for, for Tanzania. Yeah. So so elephants are a bigger problem than ever. Um, yeah, yeah, because... When, uh, when, they meet, yeah. when they meet people like People, that, animal conflict, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, just recently he was telling me that when, um, they do it from helicopter sometimes. We, we were talking last <laughs> time, the little bubble front helicopter. And, yeah, and the and, original Batman. And he said the uh, the kind of the graduation ceremony for their game department guys was that they'd make them the beaters for this helicopter elephant culling oh so they have to walk through and yeah so you'd have armed game rangers who are the new graduates of this program that he invented and he'd make them be the beaters and they'd push the elephants in and um you know the wild west That's so just cool. crazy well, was your mother born there she's born yeah born in kenya um or in nairobi because that was the, yeah. the best hospital but then raised in in moshi tanzania so how old was she when she came to america Teenager, um, so they wow. they what came. A, what a cool life for her! Yeah, um, they came to the states um, mid mid to late seventies ahead of uh, Idi Amin's invasion yeah. and the and the trouble out there. But um, he came to Montana because his hunting client American oh, hunting clients were there. Well, yeah, they were like, hey, if you're going to move to the states um, and you like the sporting lifestyle um, and being your own man, go to Montana. And Montana in the seventies was really um, not like it is now. Not yeah, oh, like and not in a post Yellowstone show kind yeah. of time. Um, well, is so your family's been there ever since. Yeah, in in one form or another. Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, because I just thought, yeah, when, yeah, because yeah, after Ernest left Cuba, then he went to Ketchum, right? Yeah, Idaho. Yep, that's where where he died. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't know your family was like been there. In, yeah, and that, that part yeah. of the world. He, you know, at least my grandparents were. Um, my mom grew up there for a while, but yeah, um, that's where we all ended up. That's um, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, 
What was your, what's your favorite memory from your trip to Africa this time? Um, I, I guess it's kind of picking out some of those hunts. Um, and like, um, you know, I, I hunt, um, I've grown, grown up doing it, love to do it, but it's, it's not like, I'm not a serious driven every eat, sleep, drink, hunting kind of guy. Like some people are. Yeah. It's, um, so for me to say the hunt was really significant, that's, that's interesting for, for me to say that out loud and try to understand it. But, um, these experiences were just just outrageous to be, to be in that environment, to be, um, to be on your own doing these things, um, with these people too. Um, characters, the, the character and, and that's, that's for me. So in, you know, if I go hunting in Montana, I go alone, um, and, I, and go, go out hiking, go, go look for them, do it all on your own. It's a solo event. Um, mm. and it's beautiful because yeah. of that. Oh, this, yeah. this is something t- so totally different to go with buddies yeah. Um, and to, ha- to have that, sh- that shared experience, um, was just amazing, amazingly over the top and to go yeah. do it with the, um, you know, these people that I'm with like Jason Vincent and John Hill and, and Cole Hauser and Mike Scobie and yeah. stuff and, and Rad Robertson and John <laughs> Forsyth and Andrew Prim- <laughs> these, um, these dudes are cr- like, they're Titans yeah. in, in their worlds. These guys are over the top, crazy characters and you throw them all in a pile and, or you put me in a truck with them and we got to go hunt animals in Africa. It, it's just, um, I'm still processing the, the terrible and amazing things that I saw. <laughs> and there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it, it'll grow you up fast. You know, yeah. if, 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 you know, if you're a younger guy, I guess. Well, the thing too, um, with the, with the group of people, like you're saying, and I don't know how well you knew these guys before or either. Not, not well, but you, you kind of like when, when you share this, you know, like, like you're talking about the pirates, you, you have these shared adventures. You start getting pretty close. Pretty I didn't quick. do any pirate stuff in, in Africa. No for the record. How do you think hemorrhoids happen? Jeff? I also didn't do any pirate stuff yeah. in Africa. Yeah. Um, uh, well, but, but you share these, you share these experiences and it's, it's like, um, I, I, I don't, I hate to compare it to like going to war or something, but it, it's that camaraderie. It's a, it's a, um, well, I, I think historically, at least with your pH, you know, there's a long history of those relationships becoming significant. And it's and it's not like going out with a fishing guide for a day. It's no. it's a it's a long experience where you where you learn so much about each other um, well, by doing it together. Um, y- yeah, I mean, and the, the the trust, and if you find a pH to get along with, and Brad and I just connect and we get along good. And you know, I feel like I've known him my entire life. I feel like he's my little brother or something. And, but you know, the situations to where, I mean, he and I have killed a lot of dangerous game together. We've hunted a lot of dangerous game. We, we've defended ourselves from dangerous game. Like this last trip, we were in Mozambique and we were actually hunting bushbuck and kudu on this river. And, you know, every time we're crossing this river and sandbars and shit, we see like lion tracks and yeah. stuff. And so, and there's elephants kind of around. And I remember we're going back to the truck and I set my gun down and I grabbed uh, a beer because it's, you know, like sundowners end of the day. And these cows, or well, these um, elephants, they, they just, they don't know that the truck is parked here, but they come up out of this river where there's a bunch of hippos and stuff. So yeah. there's like dangerous game everywhere. And they just randomly come up over the bank right where the truck is. And this one like big cow elephant, and she's got some adolescence. She just gets like real cheeky with us. And we're sitting there and my gun's down and I'm drinking. And Rad instantly like grabs his gun. And the elephant's like making some noises. And I'm watching, you know, and she's like 50 yards away. I'm like, yeah. You know, to me, like I, I spend so much time with Rad. Like I know when he's like, oh, fuck. We're yeah, like yeah. shit is serious. It's kind of like when your kids yell, you know, oh, I'm hurt. Or ah. You know, like yeah, there's a difference. You, in, you, you know the dad tone. So, yeah, yeah, so so I'm watching Rad's posture and everything, and he grabs his gun. He starts like, yeah, and this elephant comes closer and does kind of like a mock charge. It's kind of like far away. And 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 then, you know, and, and for me, like being the newbie there, we got two trackers who are, you know, they're natives, they're indigenous people there. Mm-hmm. They live where right here where there's a ton of animal, like, um, you know, community conflict. And I'm watching them, and to me, it's like, if Rad's not pointing his gun, and they're not freaking out, I'm cool. So I'm just sitting there watching, drinking my beer. And uh, 
does a little mock charge, but it's still like it's not all that close. But I'm like, huh. And then it turns its whole body and starts another mock charge, and I see both of the trackers. One jump over the cab onto the hood, and run, and the other one like jump off, and then um, and Rad's like, Kevin, get your fucking gun! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, ah, uh, and I'm like, I, I feel like you've got it handled, Rad. But anyway, it's a situation, you know, and, and we were probably five feet from shooting this fucking elephant in, in defense. And, um, you know, so you go through these things. And he and I have been in these situations like with Buffalo, too, you know, to where we shot, you know, with Thomas with it. We shot a Buffalo at nine yards and that like is very close yeah. and very yeah, easily. Very close. So you start sharing these experiences and it is something that like, you, you know, gets you gets you close and. Yeah, and you know uh, we m- my experience was a little different than yours because we didn't do any dangerous game on that hunt. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have a couple of days. You kill some big animals. You have some crazy shots and hunts. And you know, um, we were shooting at baboons. And um, you know, we we had like a Taurus forty four on on the trip too oh, with a red Brett, dot on it. Yeah. Brett. Well, actually, somebody else brought it. Um, really? Jason probably brought it. Well, Mike's Mike Scobie oh, brought Scobie. it. Yeah, he he. I would oh. say the forty four tracker or something. Um, cool ported forty four. Did you guys kill anything with it? Well. Um, so I'm sitting at that dining table. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you. Well, so some people did. I, I, I tried, um, you know, the barbecue grill that used to be on the end of the, yeah, porch. we sh- yeah, we <laughs> shot the bry. Um, well, I'm sitting at the table and Andrew Pringle comes in and I don't know, I was hiding from the group or something, trying to, trying to like f- eat some food to <laughs> yeah, soak, soak up, the soak up the booze. And, um, he, he's like, Pat, he's like, get out of here and shoot this fucking monkey. <laughs> That sounds like Andrew. Yeah. And, and um, I don't know. It's like he the, has a lust for the monkeys. And the well, I it, guess if I lived there, I'd be yeah. Well, yeah, my and, house. I'd be shooting the shit. But out it was like I, I didn't know Andrew very well. So this was like day, like day two, and yeah. I'm, I'm barely yes, clinging on to reality. Yeah. And he's, he's like, "Come shoot this fucking monkey!" And I walk out the door, and they just you know slap this 44 in my hand, and I'm like, w- "Where is the monkey?" And he's like in the yard right by the fire pit you know it's like standing on the safari chair and uh, I, I i try to walk up on him and, and you know monkeys are hard to kill is, yeah is yeah. what i'll say uh well so. th- they get shot at around there so yeah, they don't they don't stick around very so long i think that was andrew's problem was that this was this particularly like audacious monkey that came in so close who's been shot at and he'll still yeah. come in like Fuck you. well they'll come <laughs> in the lodge guy was saying he's like yeah, he's, yeah you gotta he's keep like, your make sure you keep the yeah. windows and doors shut because they'll come in your in your uh, room <laughs> um, but the the other thing too even outside of the so like you have been with rad a bunch of times now um even for like the engineers me specifically whatever like got we didn't know any of them but you spend more time with those dudes then you do away from them because you're only sleeping a couple hours a night, whatever. Then you're spending all day and all night with them. So like, yeah, you're together like yeah. 18 hours a day. Right. We're sleeping like six hours. Yeah. And the cool thing for me, like to talk about the, the camaraderie or whatever, um, you were the same way, but every group that went back, like we would have these days, just incredible days with these crazy hunts, whatever you come back and you would expect the guys that you're with to, once everyone comes back into the lodge to be like, let me tell you about what happened today. But it was always, what happened to you today? I'll tell you about my story later. I want to hear what happened yeah, to you. Yeah, like, everyone wants to hear what everybody else did because everyone's so excited to hear about it. And even though you could have had the greatest day of, the, of your life, mm-hmm. you go, yeah, I'll tell you later. What happened to you? And the, like that's the cool. You don't get that elsewhere. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it but th- like that, but that's exactly how it how it was. Like yeah. I, d- I do want to share what happened, but I'm, I'm almost more curious what happened right. to you because the, sh- the shit that's been happening to me right. is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, well, I, I was excited about that because, you know, it's part of the reason for me to take all the guys. Right. You know, is I know it was going to change everyone's life. And, like, I've been there, and, and I understand. But, like, I want to hear everyone's, their view. You know, like, I couldn't wait to talk to Jose every day. Yeah. Because I knew, you know, I've known Jose a long time, and I knew how much this was going to, like, mean to him and change him. But I didn't anticipate, like, Mitch and Nick, who kids – that, that work for me engineers that have grew up in the Midwest been hunting their entire lives. Yeah. And you know, when I asked Mitch, he, who's kind of like the grumpy old man of the group, Sometimes. but yeah, but you know, like a great dude and just mm-hmm. a wonderful human being. But like Nick, I would expect to embellish to like make me feel good for bringing him over there. Like, like maybe that's the point, but Mitch is not the guy that's going to give you like the, extra feedback or compliment or anything 
And I asked him, I was like, and he would tell me, like, especially near the end of the trip, think every day, thank you so much. I was like, ah, just, man, I just want you to have a good time. And so at the end, he says it, and and I'm like, well, explain to me, like, quantify this trip compared to your expectations. He's like, it was ten times better. He's like, even though you talk to us about it all the time, like it does it, it you just can't yeah. explain well enough how incredible this is. He's like, this trip was literally 10 times better than I was anticipating. And I was anticipating it to be incredible and change my life. Yeah. You yeah. can't convey, like, I can't tell you the experience that you're going to have. Cause one, I don't know Two, you're not going to have the experience I had. Yeah. And three, like you got to just figure it out. And, and you know, like, like I said, I spent a lifetime studying and preparing for it. Yeah. And, and, um, by a couple days in, I didn't want to look at my African books that I brought to read at night or something. I just couldn't stand it because it, um, I was, I had, I had this funny like feeling of, of disappointment that all of my heroes and things who, um, I thought were the definitive experts on analyzing and conveying to people what the African experience feels like in, in this context. And I was like, you know, Hemingway, tried his best you know we, we had one of the greatest authors that ever lived gave his best shot to write and explain what this is and i want to throw that book over my shoulder <laughs> and say he fucking missed the boat it's bigger than that it's better than that whoa and, that's that's um that's it, amazing because it's not just i mean the entire world recognizes like yeah his body of work and his, you know and, and i'm not and saying the there's African anything part. wrong with the work i'm just saying that yeah but it's it, so, he still couldn't describe it's so it. special that even our very best fell short in my yeah. opinion yeah. Of, of describing it and that's why we're here how many hours have you guys spent you know discuss it like like i have at home I, and I, s- I spend half my <laughs> fucking day every day uh, yeah. <laughs> it comes J- up and J- you know day. jason vincent calls me and he's like man i'm just sitting here thinking about drinking a lion beer you know, we're still like, like we're still yeah. trying to interpret and and digest this thing. And he's been there oh, he's a been, dozen times. Yeah, he's been yeah. a bunch. And because um, it was funny when I told him I was going on the lion hunt in Mozambique, and and like he didn't ask, he just said, "I'm fucking going with you." And I'm like, "Yeah, you should." And he's like, "Oh, the kid, you know, I got the thing," and this, and I was like. I don't have to explain to you how special <laughs> yeah. this is going to yeah, be. You, you know. make your own choice, man. Yeah, you do. But, you do what uh, you got to do. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's it's going to be an incredible adventure. And, like, I can't stand – I mean, you're right. And I can't stand the thought of missing out on any of it. it it's just so – it's so different. And, and that, to me, is like I always want to take people when they – you know, some people who they've never been – I have a list in my phone I was telling you about. Yeah, yeah. Of all the people in my life that I want to take that either – wouldn't go or wouldn't have the resources to go or whatever the thing is because I want to keep being reminded, you yeah. know, like Jose reminded all of us. I just talked to him the other day and he was like, man, I wish we were just because I mean, and it's it's not even obviously it's the hunting. It's and it's the to sharing the stories after, but it's the stupid little shit that yeah. is the best part. Well, h- hunting gets you closer, I think, than most things. And I'm sure that's, you know, to some degree you know the military guys when they're in war you have like these extreme things happen to you in your life and it's hard to explain especially if you hunt here in america how that connection can be different than it is here but it is yeah but it's one of the oldest you know it's maybe the oldest tradition that we have as as humans or some right so to go to go do this hunting thing together it's it's a bonding experience um you know we go play squash together or something and it wouldn't be quite the same well there is something you know um, the, the primal aspect of you you know part of hunting yeah prim- it, primal that's the word I'm there's looking everything for, yeah. leading up to it and i think it's why a lot of people will hate hunting who are just ignorant about it is is, is because all they focus on is the last one percent like shooting the animal is yeah like yeah, I, I don't, I don't think there's any it. like conservationists or people that hunt. Like I, I like to shoot and kill stuff, but it's not, it, it, it's not that, like hunters want something necessarily to die. Like that's not the thing, and it's, it's a really difficult thing to explain until you go do it. Boy, there's a lot, there's a lot of facets to it. That's why I, I'll stick to the easy stuff. That it is interesting. The easiest part to explain for me is, you know, I just met Jay this morning, mm. but I know that he went to this place and had the experience that I did. Mm. We. We know something about yeah, each other. Yeah, you're in the same yeah. fraternity. We, yeah, yeah, it's a it's yeah. it's a brotherhood kind of thing, and oh. um, it's like 
if you went and did that, I know enough about you that you got to be, you must be cool. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't have well, done that. I or am. even if you weren't, <laughs> yeah. Or if oh you weren't boy, cool when he? you got there, which I think we know some people like that, you leave mm, cool. Yeah. You know, because yeah. you you can't resist that positive um, effect. Whatever whatever it is that happens. No, to, it, it, um, it is. I think a very positive. Like I, I I don't think anyone goes there and they come back less happy than they were. Like, I, don't I, you, I don't know how I you don't could. Know how that could happen. But you know, it, it's funny. Like I explained it a couple of times when people are like, "I was I was two inches taller." When two I came inches back. taller, <laughs> just, just like yeah, yeah. I, I was. And, and the handsome. crowds parted in yeah. front of me. It yeah. was. But I, I'll tell guys like sometimes like I, I've said this a couple times. To people they're like, oh, "Okay, well, what's it really about?" And I was like, "You know, you remember the first time you saw boobs? <laughs> like, that's what this is like. Like it, it's in that same category yeah. of like." feelings uh emotions impression that it's going to make on you long term i've never in my life and still probably won't been jealous of dude if someone tells me like oh i'm going to shoot i'm going to go bow hunt an elk in whatever idaho or, or wherever i go that's really cool but i don't have this like i won't think about it and stew over and be like man i'm really jealous of yeah. that but any time in the future even the however many times you go next year like any time someone goes i'm going to crusaders for two weeks i will sit there and go oh, I man, I was yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. and i've never had that before that's an interesting way to look at the ego aspect of it. and it could be age because i i've always had a lot of that or jealousy or things growing up but i think hunting is one of the things where i'm still competitive but it's one of the things when people tell me they're getting to go on a hunt, like I know how it changes you and how wonderful they are. And it could be any hunt. It's the one thing where I'm not, I think, jealous or envious. Like it is one place in my life where I can honestly say, like, I am so excited for that person. Right. Um, yeah. and, and two, I want to hear, you know, all, all the highs and lows and the whole story when you it, come and back. And that's, you know how like somebody, the way I think about it, somebody is trying to like tell you about the dream they had. And, and you're like, uh, yeah, all right, yeah. you know, you keep, uh, fine, I'll listen to your dream. And you don't really care. But when somebody's like, I like, I want to hear people's hunting stories, like the, yeah. the African hunting story. I'm like, actually, tell tell me about it. Yeah. You know, what, because then you can, what you, you do can next? put yourself yeah. there too. Yeah. Like you can be like, oh, that's really similar to what happened with us or or, or, or even if it's not. So, so I, I, w- I wonder now thinking about it, if, if it's like in, in the modern world, we don't have these experiences anymore, typically. You, you know, in our, oh, in our what a loss in our day jobs. But here, here we are experiencing something that's the oldest primal tradition that we that we have. Yeah, and it it rewires you somehow. Well, it's you know? I mean, it's a tribal thing. I mean, humans are inherently yeah. tribal, and and so many problems in the world and and issues or whatever, it kind of falls back on that whole tribal uh, us being innately tribal. And yeah, we I think once you do that or all the experiences that we've shared, it puts you in a tribe. And I think that people, uh, they need that. They yearn for that. And, and that's my, uh, and on, on my trip, I had some of the biggest personalities in the world <laughs> were on yeah, that trip, you, you, yeah. you know, thrown, thrown together. So the first couple of days were pretty interesting as all that gets yeah, kind of sorted, sorted out. out yeah. But, uh, but it wasn't like somebody did uh, dominated the conversations and emerged, you know, uh, on top of everybody. It was more like our egos shrank in, in or, or at least in, leveled out or, le- or level or level yeah. you know to a sustainable level just compared to what we we were all watching and experiencing this thing and we decided to make that the the, the focus cool. of, um, yeah. well because hunting is something that can humble your ass real quick oh yeah too. yeah and yeah. that uh, and that terrain like you learn to respect that yeah, terrain i don't care there. how fit you think you are how tough you think you are how good you can shoot like you can get humbled hunting yeah. with a quickness. And I mean, it happens every time. And, and I we, love that part of it too. Um, and th- it's, it's interesting what, what that can lead to. Like um, um, a, a guy I was hunting with who, who was probably objectively one of the best rifle shots in the country. Um, and I wasn't there. Second, second, best, second, best. second, best. <laughs> um, he, he was having some equipment trouble with an optic. He had an optic that was just not tracking properly. Where it was got, kind of got worse and worse throughout the week. Um, and uh, what it's a happens, horrible feeling. He was you know lo- losing confidence, but he but he was so good. He knew his equipment. He had had the dope worked out, but the the scope wasn't tracking properly. I didn't I won't, won't trash any anybody in particular. Yeah. But um, what happened is he took a shot on a bush buck that he knew he could make, and something happened, and. It took the horn 
off the bush buck at the base of its skull. Um, rock that bush buck's world. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and uh, I, I wasn't in the truck. I was in the other, I was with Rad yeah. when, when this happened. And um, the other hunter was, was with John and um, we, we got called in to come help this. So, okay. So here, here's this, this really gifted hunter who's now having a humbling experience. Mm-hmm. Who's embarrassed, yeah. or, or mortified really that this has happened. Um, and, but it led to this adventure. Yeah. That that followed because we we went in to help because you now never know. now we got a wounded one horn bush buck <laughs> in the um in the jungle uh and now it's a unicorn hunt yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. um because because we're, we're you know we're not going to leave this animal we're going to salvage the situation um so we went and met up with him we would make a plan and we're gonna um John and Rat are going to run into the bush with Stitch um oh, and the rest it. and the rest of us we had three hundred rifles and we we line up um across kind of uh, this, this valley riverbed um, to try to flush it. And then, um, you know, we use the trackers as beaters. And, um, you know, John and Rad are stripping, stripping down, in, you know, just to their shorts and, and pistols because it is yeah, in, impenetrable bush. It's one of the um, kind of bush buck. <laughs> yeah. It's and, thick there. Um, and the, the concern, I mean, so, you know, you, you guys, we all know that bush buck will just fucking kill you. Yeah. Um, they'll stick you in the femoral and you're done. Um, and but one, it, one horn is even more dangerous. Yeah, yeah. and and you know, now we know he's pissed too, right? <laughs> um, but the the attitude of everybody there, because this is the second week, we're all concerned about Stitch, the the terrier, the Parsons yeah. terrier, right? We didn't want her to get gored, and Rad was yeah, because that's about the biggest enemy to her. Yeah, yeah, this is the most dangerous situation for that that dog, um, absolutely. Um, so you know, Rad Rad was beside himself. It was difficult. Um, it wasn't, you know, he he wasn't sure if she, if she's ready, you know, he loves that dog. Um, but went and did it because that's the job. And, and we, so, but we were all ready to help and, and to do this thing. So, um, they, uh, they flushed it, but we never saw it. It never came. It just, just disappeared. Um, but it was so that's difficult that I mean that sucks that sucks as a hunter for that to happen but yeah. like you got to come to terms with it because it's going to happen to you oh yeah and like you're going to be humbled hunting um and I, I went and talked to him and about it and I was like man you know, this this is quite a thing I I just uh, the whole experience has been really interesting to me do you do you mind if I write about it because you know I'm like I hope you're not embarrassed or anything but I'd love to write about it because I think there's lessons here I think there's an um just just an interesting experience that we all had together yeah. and he's like. No, he said, I'm not, I'm not, um, not embarrassed at all. He goes, that's hunting. Sometimes yeah. these things happen and you do what you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. When it's to correct, when it, you're in yeah. the field and it's not a static target, yeah. like anything can happen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it can happen. It can happen when you make the best shot. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you know, I had it on this last hunt. Well, two hunts ago, I wasn't prepared properly and didn't have that exact experience, but had similar, a, a couple of similar experiences and it, it I wasn't embarrassed because it was a matter of, you know, well, you know, I was just an asshole and didn't prepare properly. Yeah. And that was my fault. And so corrected that on, on this hunt and even on this hunt. And, and I've never shot better than I did on this past hunt. I made shots. I was 100% confident in and to where rad was like, there's no way you make this shot. I've never seen this. And I'm like, man, but I did have confidence in the equipment I had prepared and I was shooting. And I was like, I've got this and, and it worked out, but I mean, I had a water buck where, you know, and, and I don't know, I don't, maybe I was overconfident, but, um, rad wanted to get closer. I'm like, no, I've got this shot from here. We got it. And I shoot this water buck. We see impact. I make a great shot. It was, I, I wouldn't have changed the position of the shot and this thing tumbles down a mountain and it lands like behind some bushes and we think it's done, and I stand up, and it jumps up, and mm. like it hadn't even been hit. And we track it, and it's just a big, tough, durable animal. The next day, we go to the same area. It's oh, in I a different. It's this. in a different basin. It's up on a hill. I mean, this is like a mile away, but we find it, and it was a one horn water buck, which is kind of like stuff that I go after now. Yeah, and that's a unicorn, man. It's yeah, a unicorn, and. It's a, like kind of in the same place on the side of this mountain, about the same distance. I'm, I was closer this shot. Take the shot. We probably should have gotten closer. Drill this thing. Great shot. Buckles it. Starts tumbling, flipping down. 
goes all the way down like 100, 150 yards to the, there's a little like dirt path at the base of this mountain it's on. Hits it. Goes again. We track it for like 500 yards. Never found it. I like I was so upset. But then it was like, well, what could I have done better? And I was prepared. Maybe we should have gotten closer, but I made good shots. Like the shots were where I would have shot it had I been a hundred yards. And it just sometimes that shit happens, man. And it's but you know you let it get down or you start doubting yourself, and then you make a bad shot and it ruins your time. And it's just like that sucked. But it's just part of hunting, especially me. I go, I shoot. I'll be there a month and shoot twenty animals. Like they don't all go perfect. Right. Well, I, I think that's when we talk about asking each other about the hunts. It's not like, hey, hey tell, tell me, was the next one great too? Was that one life-changing? Actually, they're, they're not all amazing, but they're all, um, uh, I don't know, poignant in their own way. You learn something from every yeah. one of them. I mean, yeah. the, the shooting there was far more technical than I was prepared for. I took the longest shots that I've ever taken by far, and I didn't know it was going to be that way. Um, yeah, I mean, you can shoot as far as you want there. And then some of the shots, like you were talking about, it's going to be 50 yards. Yeah, it's, it's just... just but di- some of the 50-yard shots are more difficult than the longer shots. Yeah. Uh, so, you, you know, I, I'm going to Africa, and I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm into the traditional part. I like the classics. So uh, instead, I find myself, you know, proned out behind a McWhorter 7 STW looking at a warthog at 650 yards, yeah. and they're standing next to me you know, ranging and a guy standing up there with a Kestrel and I go, man, this is, this I guess is I didn't, very far <laughs> I didn't, I didn't it. picture it this way, but it, this is awesome. Um, and then that's a full experience. And then the next day I'm in a pith helmet shooting a warthog with a 375 Holland and Holland off of sticks, you know, that's cool. with, with epaulets. Uh, <laughs> so, God. You, so I, you know, I, I had as classical an experience as I, as I desired to, but, um, the, the technical stuff, like, um, our, our first day there, I didn't bring a gun because I was going with somebody. It was my first time so and I didn't want to mess with it. Sure. And well, good choice. I was going to borrow weapons because we had enough rifles. Yeah. Um, I, what happened on the first day is I didn't expect everybody to party so hard that they would sleep in. Oh, so I'm, have a gun. I'm the only one awake and I don't have a gun <laughs> to go hunting. with. So we, you know, we're, ki- we're boy, kicking, uh, I don't know. To me, common courtesy is out the window. You get yeah. drunk, sleep in. <laughs> They're I need all your, your gun. gun. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you know, I, I was so, you know, hour one, I'm like, well, I don't want to take anybody's gun because what if they wake up and they want to go hunting? And then hour two or something, I'm waiting. I'm like five, six cups of coffee in. Um, oh, I, I would have uh, flipped yeah. a fucking I was, table. I was, I was like, guys, I was talking to Rad and John. I'm like, can we let's let's go do something? I'm in Africa. It's my first day. Let's let's go. Let's go kill something. Yeah, your friends and, are assholes. Uh, and uh, they're like, okay, well, we'll you know grab some stuff. And um, then uh, I walk outside, and Rad's like, Pat, get get up here. I'm like, what? He's like, you got to shoot this fucking baboon. They they really wanted me to kill monkeys in Batman. <laughs> Rad, Rad so, and Andrew, um, vicious lust for those yeah. things. So uh, same thing. A rare, rarely, uh, rare for for it doesn't happen often. There, this baboon had wandered into 400, 450 yards um, oh, that, ab- on the cliff above. I was going to say it was above above the camp. Yeah, yeah. Exactly so so I walk outside. It, it's rare if it's not running at that distance. Yeah. So um, I, I walk outside and Rad's got his his two sixty set up on the top of the Land Cruiser. And he's like, get get up here and shoot this fucking baboon. So get up in the in the bed of the truck. Um, you know, we leaned over the top of the of the cab um, to take the shot of this baboon. Um, you know, and, and baboons are tremendously difficult to kill. I I have found yes. unless you can shoot them. Um, and so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless I've never killed one in a knife fight. <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't go hit it. But uh, when I was in Uganda, we um, you you try to hit him with the the bull bar on the Land Cruiser. Uh, yeah, if they're not shot at, because <laughs> yeah. I've been in other parts of Africa where they're not hunted. There's no quota or whatever. Yeah. And they'll be 20 yards from me. They just sit there. And it's like, but if you're in the Eastern Cape, they're hunted. Oh, and, and they're vicious, they ugly, dangerous all, animals. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah like, it's, it's not, canines we're, like We're not this. sick. They are, is, yeah. the, is the thing. But when, um, so I had somebody tell me, like, you know, you'll never, because it seems like you're always going to hit them. I wasn't trying to hit them when, when I was driving a, a truck um, on a previous trip. But uh, I was like, man, they're all over the road. You guys hit them all the time? And somebody's like, no, you can't hit them. You try to hit one. I said, all right, I'll try to hit one. I was 18. I was like, I'll try to hit one. Um, so baboons will do this thing. You, you'll come barreling down the road at them, and they'll stand there and they'll look, look you in the eye, right? And um, then 
just seconds before that bull bar like impacts them, they'll take this little like side step two inches to the side and the whole truck will just miss them barely. So I took a shot at 450 or, or 440 or something with that 260, um, you know, and it cracks off and that baboon's standing there looking at him and he just does that same like two inch sidestep <laughs> in, impacts on the rocks behind him. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you had one head fake you when we were in the Cowie. Remember it was looking at you and bobbing its head back and forth. No, it was the second animal you shot at when we were in the Cowie the last day that we hunted. It was sitting by the, there was like a, uh, there was a cattle fence that ended and we were going to go through like a gate. <laughs> oh, and you, yeah. you shot at the warthog before and then you shot at that. And Rad's like, he's like, why is it moving its head? <laughs> yeah, I remember Asking that. us if, if we're going to know. Yeah. And it was like just bobbing and weaving. You put one right next, right next to its head. It had just moved its head. <laughs> through the fence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah the, little, the little sheep fence. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. He walked out there and was just like. And we're all looking at it like, what is he doing? Because it's just bobbing back and forth. Yeah. They, they yeah. just, kind, you know, uh, kind of, kind of dance around. And that's, idiot. that's what's fun with, with, uh, with those guys too that I noticed like when you're with somebody like Rad or, or, or John or Andrew and they see something out out there in the wild that they've never seen before yeah, they that, ask that, us. that gives them pause <laughs> yeah that that speaks to how I don't, I don't know how, how amazing that is that how, how often that happens right cause because these are guys forever. who live in it all year long and they're still encountering things that just shock them. yeah, yeah. I, I think oh, it's yeah. part of the adventure and excitement like when I said when you just you go out in the bush there. You don't know what you're going to see or what's going to happen. And I, I don't think people realize that you can that this still happens somewhere. That yeah. The, that, that you can actually have experiences like this. It, and there's such still. an abundance. You know, it's the there's all the things like the geography, the culture, the people. It's all different and just awesome and interesting and exciting. But the abundance of animals, like, like, like you and Thomas growing up here, where the winters are so harsh and so long, and there's not a lot of animals here. Right. Yeah, like you Compared just don't with. see many animals. And um, being in a place like that where you can see hundreds of animals in the wild every, every day, day yeah. like, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it, it, it's well, so, because I, I know I still, you know, 20 years later, on I see whitetail, I still, like, freak out and I'm so excited. But, you know, here it's so rare. And, and you yeah. know, even having me having a feeder in the backyard here in New Hampshire, I see a deer once a month. Yeah. And, and there. The, oh. And the, the flip side is funny there because uh, they get used to, you know, there, there's a herd of sable in the yard. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. we got we to wait for the sable to walk by kind of so we can drive on kind of thing. Yeah. But um, like the, the red lacheway there yeah. we we went to um some of the guys want to get a lake way and uh we went down to the cowie near the cowie to do that and um when we shot one and then we talked to the landowner the guy who owned the prop bert down there yeah. and he's he's like oh thanks for shooting that lake way and we're like oh well you're you're welcome and he goes they've been tearing up my fences <laughs> yeah you know they're yeah. awful on fences and you just don't think about these these red lake way is as beautiful an animal yeah. as i've ever seen it's gorgeous in in the wild and it's it's a pest. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, they, they tear well, up the cattle fences. It's, I, I mean, even the uh, extreme, like no one in America cares if you shoot a red lechway. But you, you poke a lion or an elephant. Or you know, a giraffe. Like, yeah, yeah, people lose their shit. And it's like those things to the communities down there are a huge nuisance. Like lion would be extinct if it weren't for hunting because all the people in the communities, like they raise sheep and cattle and plant corn and lion they snare lion shoot them in the head with a 22 it's like they're just a pest they just kill them and leave them let them lie did, um did you you guys see the spot where the cape lion was killed mm -hmm. and they talk about that yeah. um have you guys talked about that on the podcast yeah. well it's like was andrew's like great great granddad or something shot the last cape lion which was a lion in the eastern cape that was it's called an Eastern Cape mountain lion, I think, but it was, it's 30% bigger than the lions now. Oh, and, qu and quite a bit more I aggressive. Didn't about, I didn't yeah. know about any of this. And, and, and so yep. you, you think 30% bigger than 550 pound lions. Right. It's, so it was, it, yeah, it was, well, I'm, I'm sorry. The, in the Stormberg, uh, so Andrew's best friend from childhood where they went to boarding school and all together. So it was his business partner for a while and he lives in the Winterberg mountains and that's where his family is okay. from. That there's a painting in his house and where the it's the last one that was killed and it was there and it was um the painting is of them in one of the little uh barn buildings caping it out and it's like this wow. painting from the 1800s 
and that was in uh, one of the barns that I think now is an office. It's been made into an office on, on Chris's family's property. That's And it's in their dining room, the painting is. That's cool. So they evidently, they, they killed them out because they were... Um, yeah, they're raising they're kill, sheep. Right, the right, livestock, yeah. livestock. And I think, so that, the last one was shot in the 18... Yeah. Some, something. Yeah, right. But yeah. I hadn't heard about that. And I went, you know, I had to go look it up and do a right. little research on it. But yeah, they were like 30% larger and by all accounts more aggressive yeah. than, than modern, um, the modern lions. And then I, I read some more that sometimes now when they, a modern lion is killed and um, they do a postmortem or something, we're like bigger lions that we see today or more aggressive lions, sometimes man eaters or sometimes depending on the situation when they analyze the DNA, they often find that they have markers it's that come from, that come gate. from that the, they uh, an ancestor derivative from the Cape line. Yeah, that's um, insane. It's uh, in in this painting, and I forget it's this it, it's this like famous artist, I guess, from like the eighteen hundreds that painted a lot of um, African and hunting stuff. Yeah, did this and, um, and those Afrikaners they love that uh, hyper realistic oil paintings mm-hmm. too, and, and, and this thing, but in the painting so it's got the guys and you know you can tell it's the 1800s just by like their attire and stuff but the lion like in the painting is huge like it's at the ceiling and it's on the the ground in this barn and you know it's twice the height of the men that are caping right. it out yeah because uh, i mean i know even the one that i shot 550 pounds or thereabouts yeah. it took seven of us all we could do like grown men to get Dude. it into the back of a truck wow. so i'm like I mean, the, not to the same extent as Africa, but here, even in like the so the coast of New England, there's old paintings and drawings from um, the settlers, and they would like they'd row into these cliffs that would wash out during the tides, and they'd get up to these. There's a lot of written accounts of it. They'd get up to these cliffs when the low low tide would come, and man-sized lobsters would crawl out of them oh. and go into the water. Oh. And they're like, oh, we're all set. Like, <laughs> I mean, you can you can those, still those are sea monsters. Man. Yeah, yeah. You can still find there like museums with shells of lobsters oh, that are five, six huge. feet wow. long, like man sized lobsters. I didn't know that. I mean, I've seen the ones like the monster ones now right. that are maybe like a couple feet long or yeah, something. Yeah. Whole yeah, that would be so creepy because yeah. they're so alien they're gross, and prehistoric yeah. looking. Yeah. Um, I have a gear related question. It's one that we've asked before, but now we have a new guest. Who's asking? Um. So you said that you didn't bring a gun, but you now having been, um, people ask a lot, and we get the question a lot of like, what is my necessary kit when I go over to Africa? Specifically, oh. we'll say Crusader, um, but it doesn't even need to be just guns. But The, the well, must-haves and don't waste your time with. Yeah. You know, uh, so I was, I won't say deliberately misled. But maybe intentionally, um, <laughs> my, my 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 colleagues on that on that trip. But uh, y- you know, we th- uh, they were expecting much milder weather than we had. What what happened was we caught the tail end of winter mm. uh, with, with the reverse seasons. Lucky um, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, y- you know, there was lots of jokes with these guys, the the field ethos dudes, and they're like, you know, oh, just bring a pair of shorts. Don't bring don't bring underwear. You, you know, yeah. all, all this stuff. Well, um, I'm I'm from Montana. I just can't. And, and I'm an overpacker, so I, I I don't I don't roll lightly or pack lightly, was, and so I ended up bringing all kinds of stuff, and um, we nearly froze to death the first week. I was in, I was in long underwear. I was in you know my first uh, the first animal or two that I killed in the first week. Like look back at the pictures, and I've got four la- uh, four jackets on, yeah. um, and it's sideways sleet. And, yeah, I just um, went and put a <laughs> yeah. <on> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I uh, that that was kind of conditionally specific, but um. You know, I, I brought the leather boots. I brought the Courtney boots, um, and those turned out to be fantastic. Mm. Um, I was going to bring something like a little stouter that we might use, like in, in Montana for um, backcountry stuff. Um, but and, and so, you know, what happened, like, with boots is you, you're you walking in the fields, and you're like, okay, glad I have these leather African hunting walking boots. Um, but then, you know, climbing or doing some serious downhill stuff when we were climbing down boulders and, mm-hmm. and cliff faces, I – felt like I might have liked a little more ankle support. Oh yeah. You know, um, I don't know, but I, I also, I had this phobia that I was going to like blow out a knee and get, yeah. 
and uh, get benched for the whole African hunt. <laughs> I was terrified of that. I had, I brought a knee brace in my bag. <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going down. So I was a little over preoccupied with uh, my footwear and stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the, the gun stuff, um, we had all kinds of guns. We had lots of different kinds of guns with no, no rhyme or reason. Well, everybody brought, you know, what they right. thought they might might want to have i didn't know what we're i didn't know how it was going to be um now looking back i'd like the idea of building up specific rigs for particular types of african hunts um Mm. like something a little shorty with for bush buck you know with like maybe like a 1x red dot or something Uh, seems like a lot of fun i think you need two guns for africa um at least um Maybe two. you do it too. So yeah. you know, if I was going to go back, like I love this idea. Like I think a mini fix with a red dot would be pretty bitching for chasing bush buck in the jungle. Yeah, like that's another hunt that I I didn't get a bush buck. I want to go back and do that. Yeah. Um, you know, a, I like a bush buck. Yeah. Um, and then some something for this longer range stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't go chasing mega long long range shots. Um, because I'm not. Uh, evidently good enough to, <laughs> to, to make them. Um, but I like to shoot long range, but yeah. um, you, you know, something kind of yeah. reasonable and, and a lot lighter, I think, than you might think. Um, six, five, you could probably do a lot, but I mean, you get, get a wind mag, get 300 wind mag and, and lay waste to everything, yeah. which, yeah. so if, if you're bringing one gun, I'd say something like that. Um, like a mega fix. Mega fix. Yeah. The mega fix would be pretty cool. Yeah. So six, yeah. 300 wind mag with 16 inch barrel. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that water buck would be dead right now if if I were shooting 300 wind mags in a six five. But you know, you can't, we see weird, weird stuff out there. You can't account for, for everything, I guess. Um, Yeah. So, you know, you'll never, never have quite the right thing. Um, like we, we had another thing where we shot a, we shot a a white bless buck, um, at 600 something yards. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, spined him, we think, and um, and it was a beautiful, beautiful trophy animal, and um, we didn't want to shoot it again with another seven STW, um, and and uh, blow out the cape or, or something. Um, so uh, I don't know. There's a, another discussion about trophy hunting for another day, but um, the caliber was too big, so we had, we had to walk up on it, and um, uh, which we did. So we had to cover a lot of ground. We had to walk up this whole bowl, up this cliff, this uh, scree to this cliff face to go look at this uh, wounded white blessed buck who was sitting there looking at us, um, but couldn't couldn't run away. And um, so John Forsyth comes out with his his P three twenty, and he he's like, well maybe maybe we should shoot it with this. Um, actually, no, we were up on the hill. He radios down. He sends the tracker to go to go get the pistol. The tracker comes back, and John looks at his pistol and he dumps the magazine. And he goes, oh, you know, shit. Uh, we we say what and he goes I don't have any any FMJs. He he goes um because uh, John Forsythe's from the Tal and he was up there during the civil unrest that had just happened weeks before, and he's like all my magazines have 124 grain you know yeah. Ranger <laughs> Winchester Rangers in it, and we're like okay well we were trying not to put a big exit wound another one in this animal but uh we <laughs> we um we we ended up shooting him with that, uh and then we had to stab it. Um, had to stab it. <laughs> we shot it with a knife. John it, Hill, I'm sure, had to stab it. <laughs> so now everybody's feeling horrible. Yeah, we don't want it. We don't want animals to suffer. But but shit happens, and it doesn't matter what kind of like crazy awesome wildcat cartridge you have, or, or or something weird things happen. And when we had to wait a little bit for this this blessed buck to die, and um, so you know we, we I referred to it as the Rasputin of, <laughs> of white blessed bucks. Yeah. Uh, but so so you do what you can to prepare for right. out there. But I, I, I think some, something general purpose. And then if you're kind of dialed in for a special kind of hunt, you know how to make it fun. Like like red dots for, for bush buck or something, I think would be really cool. You yeah. almost need a weapon mounted light for, <laughs> yeah. for that. Um, that that canopy is so dense. So we, well, some um, of it's nice, too, to have. I mean, in, yeah, because a lot of times you're shooting or hunting, you know, right at dusk. Yeah, and the light on the gun comes in handy if you have to go in the brush after stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's I just you don't expect it to be so dark. Amazing how dark that gets when you get under um, that canopy in the jungle. Well, well for me, I always yeah. have my gun slung. So if that kind of stuff happens, you're walking back to the truck, and maybe you got to walk 500 yards, yeah. and you got to go over a fence and all that. It's uh having my weapon, but then having a separate light. It's just not convenient. So having it on my gun. Because my gun is slung, yeah, and so it's, then it's I can have a free hand yeah. still. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. 
So, on, on, and on the other hand, I love classic guns, and because I'm a classic Africa hunting nut, um, you know, if I go back, I'm going to bring my 1903 derivative yeah. because because that appeals to me. Yeah. Um, you know, the, one of the most fun hunts I had was with Pringles 375. Holland oh Holland. yeah, that was awesome. Um, so so that kind of so I, I'm a little conflicted. Well, I like both yeah. both sides, I guess. Yeah. Um, I yeah. like all of it. Yeah. yeah after you, you got to have a little bit of everything. Yeah, after seeing that, it was funny, like, rolling around with the engineers, and there were a couple tough days on shots that some of the engineers were taking, and um, I said, I'm like, man, this makes me want to, like, come back and shoot something with, like, iron sights, and all of them were like, this makes me want to never do that. Like, this <laughs> makes me want to do the complete opposite. I want the best magnification I can have. Like, I want to do it. But, I mean, y- you know, it was their first time over, and, right. you know, I mean, one of them is one of the best shots I know, and definitely at the company, and... Um, shoots way better than me and you know I, I mean him getting there and hunting his whole life but getting you know shook up being in Africa and that experience I mean he missed an animal at two or three hundred yeah, yards it was like three something and that yeah. for me and that w- that's a gimme shot for him right and that's why like for me watching this and seeing it and it was like a couple times at first I was like this is something's off with him I yeah. thought it was his gear but then for him to I'm just rattled right and for him to recognize that and then to come back and have the best shot of his life on a kudu was like yeah he had a rough couple of days and yeah he, had, he was conflicted and he was really beating himself up and i'm like look man just shit happens like don't let it ruin the rest of your hunt like man the fuck up realize that you know it wasn't equipment you were excited it ha- happens. It like, all happens so fast. Straight, yeah. Straighten the shit out. Well, get, go to the range and shoot a few times. Get your confidence back. And know that you fucking shoot great. And yeah, he didn't have a hard time the rest of the hunt. No. Well, you know, it's an, another like uh, particular unique aspect of, of this kind of hunting is be when you, you know, if you go shoot something in Montana, you go out a couple of days, you make one shot. Mm. You know, you spend months preparation, make one shot. You're done, done for the year. Uh, in, in Africa, you could have several shot up or like you could take several animals a day, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. So I usually shoot 11 pounds of ammo every trip. Yeah. There, well, so you have more opportunities for things to go wrong right. yeah. for, for the human element to, to get involved in it. Nothing I think is so, so challenging, so hard on your gear or yourself or your skill set than African hunting just yeah. because of yeah. the, the, uh, the intensity of it. Um, well, did, th- terrain a lot of the terrain's unforgiving we talked about you know like a lot of these mountains where it's all boulders and stuff like that yeah. i and mean the wind you can ne- like unless you shoot wind all the time yeah the, um in the uh the mist the yeah. fabled beautiful mist in the green yeah. hills um i um i ended up bringing some some cheap binos that i hunt with in montana that is some vortex stuff that it works just fine um up there but they could not cut that mist at all, uh, I guess light transmission issue. Um, I couldn't see through it like uh, the, like the pH could or. or um, yeah, I, I think money spent on good optics, both uh, your handheld and your rifle optic, is mm-hmm. it's more important than a new cartridge, a bigger gun, a be, uh, and the that's optics. that's something like like I, I usually don't have a dog in the optic fight because I'm, I'm not in the industry. Yeah. I, I've got some stuff that I like and some stuff that I just deal with because I right I'm, yeah because uh, I don't. I haven't spent the money on something better yet. Yep. And I thought I could get away with it, but that was like, you know, you talk about the big leagues. Um, I didn't know light transmission was going to be an issue. I didn't know low light spotting and, and glassing and things were going to be so important, so critical to this process. Yeah, because a lot of the times you're near glassing, it's into the side of a hill or a mountain mm-hmm. where it's a lot of bushes. Yeah. And, you know, the kudu or whatever animal will be inside of that. And, it might not be dark outside, but it's dark where you're looking, mm-hmm. and you need every little bit that you can get. Yeah, so I, I think every every little edge yeah. there helps, and then you know, then go take a cool iron shot, right, yeah. uh, iron sight shot. Right. Yeah, range finder is yeah needed, <laughs> very <laughs> necessary when it's terrain and animals you're unfamiliar yeah. with. Yeah, and so those those binos with the built-in laser that's that's too cool. That's the way to go. Um, yeah. Which is hysterical too. We, we ended up we brought a couple pairs of binos over with us to to re re outfit some guys. They um I don't know the, where they came from the situation, but um they Jason were they stole. were so they were so they were so yeah. <laughs> they fell off a truck. Um but they were so you know 
so critical to that process. The pH, you know, because we weren't doing dangerous games. They didn't have rifles. Um, they had these binos. They had range finding um, swaros, I guess. Yeah. Um, and well, Rad, he used to use Zeiss, and that's what he loved. But he didn't have range finding ones. Mm-hmm. And I was carrying range finding binoculars when I first started hunting with him. But they're bigger and they're heavier. And so, one of my, it may be the hunt when I was with Jason, but one of my previous hunts, I I gave them to Rad when I left, and he like didn't want to accept them. It was too much. I'm like, no, no, no trust me, I'm coming back. And now I can carry the little bitty Swarovskis that I can fit in my pocket, yeah. and I don't ever have to range anything. I'm like, Rad, what's the fucking range? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to carry the big heavy yeah. ones. So he thought I was being real nice to him, and I was just being very selfish. And then, you know, John Forsyth would always be running around with them tucked in his jacket. Yeah. And you take them out and carefully, carefully wipe them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and every time. and <laughs> I don't do that. Um, so he's, he's funny. He loves his stuff. He, you know, he loves yeah. his truck. Yeah. And we, you know, we, we'd walk, you know, drive, drive through that. You hear the thorns scrape uh. on the side. And, and I like my truck. And I, I don't like this. You hear that sound, the thorn oh, scraping on the paint. Like, eh. yeah. Thomas but, and I are very familiar with how particular Rad is about his vehicle and his yeah. stuff. Well, that so so you look over at them driving they're on the side, yeah, and and you just see him tense up, yeah. Just uh, something happened to the the push bar or whatever on on John truck or something broke or something. And his is brand new. I'm sure he might he probably had it when you were there. His it's yeah. a brand. Was it, was it zip tied? Did yeah, put the zip. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he. I've heard about that more than once. South African there. ingenuity. Yeah. 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 You know. Yeah. I um I you know it was funny. I gave those to Rad, those range findings for Oski binoculars. And um Leica sent me their new ones. Oh. Are those cool. Those are the next on my list. Yeah, yeah, so they're I like them better than the Swarovskis. And Swarovski, I mean everybody knows optic wise my favorite brand. But their range finder in those binos are better. And I used them half the time I was there hunting. Um, but I like the little pocket ones, especially when we're hunting dangerous game and I was having to crawl a bunch and do shit. I don't want like, I have the gun. Yeah. That's my responsibility, but I wanted to have some binos. And so I have the little pocket ones. They're nice, but man, those like us, I, I would only have, if I'm going over, if you can find any way to justify it, Swaro or like a binoculars and range finding. If you don't mind dealing with the bigger, heavier, but it's just so convenient. Yeah. And, you know, unless you know your pH has them, then. Right. And, I mean, to the average person, because that's the thing for me is where, similar to you, until I, like, held these guys' guns with, with yeah. Swarovski optics and or just, like, good stuff, it's always been just like, a, oh, well, I can deal with it and it'll do all right. To the average person, you could go get these, uh, these range-finding binoculars or the ones that we're telling you, and it may take you a while to realize, like, this is worth the money. But like at first you might be like, ah, I don't really know if this is worth it. But to see, so like we had, when we were with John at one point, uh, we had a farm hand with us and it, cause we just, we, did, we didn't have, there weren't enough trackers. So we had a farm hand with us and we we're looking for Kudu and I was looking at him and he's just look, I mean, they can see everything anyway. And he, he's looking at the yeah, side they, of the mountain. They, they've grown up there and lived there. They see it. I mean, it's right. like they have yeah. 10 power eyes. Well, so he's looking whatever and you know, he'll see things here and there. And I realized he didn't have binoculars and we had your, uh, like us that day and i was like oh let's give let's give him these like maybe that'll and we give them to him and game changer mm-hmm. immediately like and that's someone who's good at already seeing it he's then you, stopping the truck every two minutes oh yeah <laughs> and like he crushes it so for the average person it may take you a minute to realize like okay i just blew a bunch of money on these i don't know if it's necessarily worth it but once you get used to it you'll realize like you need it i think because optics is not sexy like a firearm that a lot of people you try to convince yourself that it's all marketing and bullshit and you're paying for the name yeah and you know the average guy maybe that has guns and goes to the range doesn't make a difference but you want to go on a real hunt yeah there, that's, that's, there's only Af- a few africa's steps the proving out. ground that's yeah where all yeah. this all the, all the bullshit you know if it's if it doesn't hold up you'll yeah. find out there and, and what a miserable feeling to be halfway around the world right Spend all that money, be on a, the most epic hunt of your life, and then you have an equipment failure. Yeah. Like, horrible. You know, when you're talking about guns, you know, one thing that I realize is most of the hunting that I do there, I want a compact, lightweight gun with a silencer. Yeah. Whoa. And in, and you're right. Like, I shot almost everything in Africa this last time with uh, our new cartridge, 8.6 Blackout, right here. Mm, yep. Yeah. And uh, 11-inch barrel with a silencer, and the gun weighed 
five pounds and it had with a Swarovski one to eight on it. And like, it's easy to become a power whore now because you can get scopes that are compact and 25 power, but it's amazing what you can actually do with eight power. Like Rad and I both made shots over 500 yards. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, suppressors too, that I, you know, I've hunted, hunted with them, hunted without them, you know, plank, plank with them, plank without them. Um, I, I like suppressors. I think they're great, but, <laughs> yeah. but, um, everybody likes suppressors, but, um, when, you know, I, I was using borrowed rifles and I was on this Elon hunt and, um, uh, the situation was, I was on the sticks for a long time mm-hmm. wa- waiting for a shot opportunity yeah. with, with, uh, dynamically changing situation in front of me with these herds moving, waiting for the shot on a specific animal with rat. So I got rat in my ear oh. and, and, uh, <laughs> shoot the, shoot that fucking follow down. <laughs> and, and it, it, um, the a man gets excited. He, he gets excited. So, and I was using a rifle without a suppressor. So I had, um, I, I had the, the game warden black magic, you know, um, tangled up earplugs, and and I had one in on my right side, the gun side, because I'm right handed, and but the information coming from Rad was so critical, and it was like up to the second updates on um you know, and and he's funny too. He's like he's like don't shoot, don't shoot, confirm that you are not going to shoot. <laughs> and I'm like, and I've had acknowledge. To, I had to pull it out. I'm like Rad, I'm not going to shoot until you tell me to. He's like don't shoot. <laughs> um, but yeah. but uh, the, I mean the, you're right. The communication yeah. is so critical. And when I've hunted over there without a silencer, it's cost me animals. And I mean Thomas witnessed it with a kudu. You, you know, uh, we turned the corner and there's a giant bull. And we were in the cowie and we were hunting a bush buck and we just happened upon this little herd in the brush of kudu. We didn't know we were there. Literally 10, 15 yards from him, he's staring me in the face, and I could have shot him for like three seconds, but I had to put my ear pro on because like mm-hmm. i ain't busting my eardrums and um missed the animal didn't have the yeah. opportunity and um because you know he's he stood there looked at us just long enough if i'd had a silence on pump you know he did but you know i'm like yeah. well, you got you got enough things you gotta yeah. worry about to get right to get it to get a good shot out there so anything you do that eliminates complication yeah. um i remember thinking like my my baseball cap was was pissing me off the whole time because you, you know i also i didn't know we were going to run bent over 400 <laughs> yards yeah or right? or crawl the or, entire or, time. you know so so when yeah, you're, my head you're, ends up backwards most of the time so that's what i ended up doing because um you know i'm bent at the waist i'm running behind rad who for a big guy can cover some ground like you wouldn't believe well you, well, you guys know yeah. but yeah. um trying to stay on him but when you're bent over at the waist and you're trying to look up but the brim of your hat is too far down, so you can't see past it. So you're just looking at Rad's ankles and running <laughs> after animals. It's um, it's hard. Yeah. To, it's hard to find something that works. And then we yeah, I was talking about you know the the pith helmet is fabulously outdated, but totally useful safari accessory because yeah. it covers. And I'm redheaded, so it covers your ears. Um, but same same problem. That, that thing will gets all of the stuff gets in your way. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what the right thing is for hats, but nothing really worked for I, me. I anymore. don't know, but you know, all these things that you're describing, these little nuances of the hunt, because it's like, uh, a, a lot of times you're stalking an animal, you're putting a stalk on and you'll go, you, you try to stay in the brush, but you get to an area where inevitably it's open for two, 300 yards mm-hmm. and there's a bush there and there's one there. And so the idea is when you're exposed, you can still, you know, and it, it's not, the majority of the time, but sometimes an animal can see you and you can approach it to a, a certain distance and it, it doesn't move. Um, but you know, the idea in that is you move slowly, quickly, but slowly, yeah. but you stay together. You try to look at it as one mass yeah. because if you're split up, that seems to alert the animals um, to danger more than if you try to stay together. So what you're saying, you're crouched down, you're trying to stay low, so you look smaller, and you have to stay right on Rad's ass. And then you need and he's the other moving guy. Fast. Oh yeah, moving he, fast, he long yeah. legs, yeah, and moving, and and you're trying to stay like a foot from one another, so you look like one mass. And you know, it's like something like that. You don't think much of it, but it's exhausting. You know, if you got to do it move quickly and you got to cover a couple hundred yards and mm-hmm. you're duck walking and you have to be a foot from someone else. It's a pain in the ass. And, and exhausting. then once you do all that, you got to make a you shot. You got to shoot. And that was yeah. one of the things that, um, Jose took a shot on a blue wildebeest or a black wildebeest and that went over its back. And, uh, it was a far shot, but we set up on one area, had to move cause of where the herd was going. We had to crawl about 
150 200 yards to where we were and then he had That's to sit in po- he had to sit in position basically up on the gun while proned out yeah. in a weird position for about 10 15 minutes and by that time he like he's You're locked exhausted. up he's locked up he's sore he's kind of shaking and like that happens it wasn't a it wasn't a normal shooting position it just and you have to make do and all those things come into come into play for sure yeah and, and it's you know I got so much you can't plan for, yeah. right? So I, I saw all kinds of funny improvised shooting positions and, and, and um, you know, things things happen quickly and, and, you know, sometimes you're shooting across Rad's lap in the driver's seat and there, things happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I, I don't know. I, th- I think that open open mind and open heart and being ready for whatever, whatever comes really, really helped out there. Um, yeah. But uh, I forgot how quick Rad can move. I didn't really see it until that last because I didn't hunt with him. Man, that's sudden. Well, when we the last day when we were with you up in the Cowie, we were going. He saw something and we started hoofing down the down the hill and everyone's oh, flying and I had this the, when you fell. Yeah, I had the big <laughs> tripod and a big ass lens on the camera, and they're <laughs> taking off and I I have to be a little behind them anyway because I had this big lens and it's way too tight. So so they take off. I'm like, oh, I gotta go with them. So we're going down and I saw this kind of like a jut like a little patch of grass because we're going i mean you saw this the it's steep yeah so i'm like oh, i can land there and i kind of just commit and it ended up being a hole and i went ass <laughs> over band box i got the the camera up <laughs> the in camera the air <laughs> and i'm like oh shit and then we go down whatever and everyone stops and turns around kevin's like are you all right and i was like yeah i'm good like whatever i just want to make sure the lens didn't go in and then we got to wherever and he was like man you folded like laundry and i was <laughs> like yeah i did I mean, <laughs> see the, the 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 sheer athleticism that's required to survive in africa it's <laughs> well it, it's one of these things like if if any of you ever watched joe rogan and um uh, cam whatever his cam name Hans. is yeah his, his hunting partner and it's like you know he just stays incredibly fit like insanely fit like it, it's not something you could even aspire to do but for him it's just like what gives me that extra like 10 percent advantage and it's one less thing to think about yeah like you just said i mean you just talked you named a bunch of things as far as like uh whether it's glass whether it's your hat whether it's all these things you you don't have time to the hearing pro you don't have time to think about all these things so if you have to think about oh wait slow my breathing down because i just i'm sucking air being exhausted it just doesn't help with anything you're doing right and yeah, I mean, it affects such a, you know, a big part uh, of the mental aspect of hunting. Like mm-hmm. if you're exhausted and you'll cut corners and you'll make a bad decision and, y- you know, and, and I've done it so many times and I was very committed on this hunt, especially, y- you know, uh, half of this hunt was a, a lion hunt and that was a very difficult hunt. And it's a very expensive hunt and it's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. And I did not want to fucking blow it. And, you know, and I thought about like some of his stories and talking about, you know, if if you want to, if you're after one particular animal, how much more difficult a hunt can be and him just not having to be concerned about if he can physically do something and how distracting that was. So I I made a lot, yeah, much more effort for being more fit than the last time I went and then also shooting because there's so many awkward shooting positions and like I shoot. I shoot reasonably well and it's easy to get comfortable with that. And then you don't practice and you don't do the things and, and you make mistakes. And yeah. So, I mean, uh, and I loved it too, cause it paid off so much for me this hunt. And even when I decided to stay on and go to the storm bird yeah. hunt in the mountains, and that was very technical hunting and difficult. And the shots are far and the animals are small. And, um, you know, I had to shoot from, you know, I, I had a couple of shots. I had one that was proned out. I had one standing, but I was able to get the gun supported well. But like I had one where we crawled into this position, then we were exposed on the side of a mountain. It's a, and it was a giant little stin buck, but we couldn't really move more. And, you know, I was in this awkward sitting position and kind of had to lay down while sitting on this rock and, Brad's like, I don't think you should take this shot. And I was like, no, I got this. And, you know, I was able to make a good shot. And it was only two something. Right. But, oh, you know, it's little, an animal yeah. this big. And it was a very, just the worst possible scenario from a shooting position. And I was like, no, I can make this shot. And like, so all those things were good. And I had a lot of confidence shooting. And, you know, that helps things to, to turn out better generally. Yeah. Um, shooting sticks, I thought, were a really interesting experience. Um I, uh, something you should practice if you plan on going something you should practice. I, so I, um, 
uh, I had a pair. Uh, I got I got one of those cool uh, African sporting creation ones that mm. have like like buffalo hair on the top and in the in the little crook. They're really cool. Um, but I brought them. You know, actually, actually, I took them beaver hunting in Montana before I went. But I didn't. <laughs> sh- but I didn't shoot off them. Um, but uh, I used them every, every day in Africa and um, in, including my my zebra shot. Oh, nice. um, was was using those and I just was astounded at how stable I was on on shooting on a tripod. Mm-hmm. shooting sticks um with when um I, I so i thought that was kind of cool um yeah. it was easier than i thought um yeah, i actually like that you better can, than a y- you can fuck shots up with them but you can make good yeah. shots with them i don't know I, I like being proned out on a bipod if i can get it but yeah. just yeah. in always the case um, but yeah i find with the shooting sticks too it's like if it's a couple hundred yards like you can blow that shot but if you get your breathing you get steady mm-hmm. on it you do the correct things you can make that shot easy and it goes farther than that. You know, I've just learned, too, like, uh, Rad, get beside me. I'm going to, you know, like, spread my legs, straighten them up, get, you know, just bent over on the gun. And, like, I like his weight being against me, too, and him being yeah, still. Yeah, supporting then that, I that, can, that elbow. And then, yeah, yeah supporting the elbow mm-hmm. on him. And, yeah, I've been able to make, you know, over 400-yard shots off of him, uh, which mm-hmm. there's no way the first time or two I went I could have done that. And, uh, you, you know, I, I saw some really unconventional <laughs> shooting, like unconventional shooting position. But I mean, you know, that that stuff I'd, I'd never had it because I hadn't hunted with a, a pH before. So to have somebody no. support like uh, your strong side elbow, uh, that's kind of cool, except when he's making you laugh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or, or he's laughing. Or, um, but, uh, you, you know, I, I saw uh, another guy uh, we were hunting with, like nearly climb on top of Rad shoulders when we were hunting bush buck in the jungle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rad's and wanted I was like, me to shoot. I've never seen this position before. Shoot I think off they of invented his, it. Well, he's wanted me to shoot off of his shoulder and, and stuff. A lot of stuff that I don't like to do. Um, and I try to avoid it. But, yeah, he's accommodating. Like, he's, he's going to, he's willing to put himself at risk for you to have the experience yeah. you want to mm-hmm. have. Um, okay. We could go on forever about the hunting. I want to ask you some stuff about what you're doing and, and kind of the family legacy and what you guys are trying to do. So you currently work for the estate, the Hemingway estate. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I work with uh, family members of mine. Um, we have uh, a couple little legal entities that we use to control uh, copyrights, uh, trademarks and media rights and that, and that kind of thing. And we're um, what's uh, kind of unique about our family is that we own pretty much the whole 100% of the intellectual property that, that we're entitled to, uh, aside from expired copyrights. Uh, so it's intact and it's family controlled. Um, so I, I'm on, uh, serving a board of directors for this our little family company, um, mostly involved with developing trademarks and yeah. um, trying to kind of create uh, products um, that are in the spirit of Ernest Hemingway that kind of gives um, uh, fans and things uh, a, a way to interact with yeah. his world. Um, and b- because of the nature of the things that the life that Ernest Hemingway led and the, the work that and things that he wrote about the people today who are fans of that um, are a really interesting demographic it seems to be a, a, a real resurgence, sort of a renaissance of and for, interest and, in him. And yeah, and and for for different reasons, I guess. You know, um, what's going on now is kind of. Uh, I, I think we can all uh, agree there's sort of a, a, a pendulum swing back to um, appreciating uh, certain aspects of masculinity. Yeah. Uh, and and the things associated with that. So that's kind of going on. There's a new, kind of a new resurgence of interest in that. But his the topics that he wrote about from from war and politics to love and relationships and hunting and fishing or bullfighting um, is are so widely diverse. Um, there's, there's something for everybody in a lot yeah, of ways. I forgot about the bullfight. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, you know, he's, he's got poetry. He's got, um, you know, he wrote a stage play. Um, there's all kinds of things. Huh. So, so it attracts multitudes of different people for different reasons. And, um, what uh so in in my work um I, I travel around we go to go to events or go go work with people that we, we do business with and I tell stories or or anecdotes and kind of help uh, interpret this stuff with with people um, oh. because uh, and so what what I find is are very interesting uh, results sometimes like I I tell you today that the in my opinion and experience 
the majority of people who describe themselves as an Ernest Hemingway fan, above average fan, uh, are women. It is interesting in a lot of the stuff that I've watched on YouTube and documentaries, a, a lot of the uh, literary like critics or, or people that study him, the majority of it, yeah, it does seem to and, be women. And he's polarizing. Um, yeah, and I mean, this is internationally. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, yeah. Um, so, there, you know, he gets criticism for, for being a, a male chauvinist or, or a womanizer or, or things like this. And uh, I, I'd say that that's, that's a, an under-informed perspective Um, well it's a pretty naive perspective when you think about okay he was in world war one and covered world war two and just that period of time and the changes that we've had in society since then and then to yeah kind of characterize him in some of these ways when you're yeah he lived in a different time yeah so are you gonna you gonna judge him by a modern lens well you shouldn't because it's not it's yeah. not fair, but uh, even more than that, it's it's um, uh, he was writing short stories um, from the perspective of women. He was writing developed female characters at a time when that wasn't really done because most most authors at that time were were male, yeah, um, to to some extent, at least the majority. So, um, having developed uh, uh, female characters that were um, given given life, given souls. Um, was really unusual. So he he's he's got these characters. He wrote about um, abortion when at a time oh. when nobody was from a from a, a feminine a, f- a female perspective. Even well, yeah. I mean, um, I guess technically he probably was a feminist when you think about that, he, like women's he, rights. He was he was somebody who had uh, absolutely had spent a great deal of time trying to understand um, the way women felt and why. Um, Th- um, and to me, that's kind of why you end up loving a lot of women. Not, yeah. not because you hate them, but because you're fascinated by them. Yeah, that is interesting to think, oh, he's, yeah, doesn't like women. But, I mean, it's clearly documented. He had a lot of important women in his life. And, yeah, just because one relationship doesn't last forever. But, yeah, if you found out you didn't like women why would you keep entering well, relationships with but, and then you know they they have like uh there's college classes around the country too where they talk about um w- uh, other female characters in his works where they're given a uh i don't know maybe an unfair shake they call it the hemingway's bitch or something <laughs> um where we dra- you know where he would write women that were um i don't know maybe more, more abrasive or or more bitter and yeah. embittered women or something. How, how would you describe it? Some, something like that. So a little bit of everything, but you know, men are like that too. We, you know, we're all over the board. Um, so he, he was more sensitive than he was given credit for. Um, some, yeah, some I mean, people d- understand just to that. take on the perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be tough to argue that. Um, realistically. So when I, when I meet these women who are mega Ernest Hemingway fans, um, they're usually people that have keyed in on that. And then there's another aspect to it where they like, uh, they'll, they'll tell me that he reminds them of their dad. You know, um, Ernest Hemingway makes me think of my father. Um, or I married a guy that reminded me of Ernest Hemingway. Because that, to, um, to uh, it seems, to a lot of women, is this like archetype that is... Um, it's comforting. It's masculine. It's safe. It's it's may, maybe it's the epitome of of a man's man. Um, yeah. At least uh, what they believe him to be. You know, he was just a dude. Yeah. He, you know, and he had flaws and all kinds of stuff. But what he what he came to stand for um, was significant uh, to people for that reason. Um, and then the flip side, you know, men. It's like, well, we you know, a lot of guys want to be like him. Actually, men are the most critical and say that you know he's a terrible womanizer and stuff. They, jealous, um, jealous, 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 jealous. Maybe um, I, I don't. It was interesting. Like I forgot about the bullfights. You know, I went to school in Spain for a couple of years, and it was when it was. Ju- so this was twenty five years ago, and it was when like bullfighting was starting to become unpopular. Okay. You know, to like Westerners who know everything, and you know, and Americans who we should tell the Spanish they shouldn't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. You know. And not understanding like Just what get an, in their business. Yeah, yeah. An important part of their culture it was. And, and it was amazing. So I went to school and there was a lot of uh, American and kind of, well, and non-Spanish Europeans that went to this school. And I wanted to go to the bullfights. And so I went a couple of times. 
And so, you know, and it was, I mean, even with within the, the school, there was, you know, discussions about it and, and stuff and some of the professors and they're telling you, oh, how they drug the bull ahead of time, they yeah. shave its horns, do all this stuff and how unfair it was. And uh, so one year I went to like the Super Bowl of, uh, you know like the year end and all the best matadors and they're like you know they're the at the time the biggest celebrity still in spain like now it's probably a soccer player or something but then they were still that famous and i went and you know because i just wanted to experience like this cultural thing that we didn't have and it was very significant there and how strange it was to have like this big bullfight and um so this grand finale, there's three matadors and three different bullfights, and two of them get gored. And it's like, oh, that's so funny. This is so unfair to the bull, which maybe they do these things to the bull. I don't know. They but like, that, I, I just, and I, I've said it before, I think, on a podcast. Like this one guy, and he's in, you know, like the pink leotard, and they come out, and they seem so arrogant. And like The you, matador. Yeah, yeah. You, and, and you want them to get gored, kind of. And, man, he took it like threw his thigh and was on the bull getting like shook around and thrown off and lands and they grab him and they get him out of there, you know? And I, I think I've told the story before and everybody starts booing and throwing shit in the arena. And, um, he, and he's wearing like a hot pink leotard, a little skinny fellow. And he comes out like 10 or 15 minutes later and his leotard was cut off like right below his ass cheek and they had a splint on his leg and like wrapped up and it's bleeding still everywhere. His leg, I mean, it was broken. Like the horn went through mm. uh, his leg and um, he comes out there on one leg and kills the bull. And you talk about like Man. the crowd going fucking crazy. Yeah. And, you know, and then they drag the bull out in the parking lot and they barbecue that thing for all the fans to go out and eat it. Um, but what, so I could see it was like, holy shit, what's happening? And, um, yeah, so I could see where, like, that was interesting to him for a while. And, and that's, so you, so you got a guy like Hemingway who, who is, is thoughtful and, and interested in understanding these exciting, adventurous things, um, like, like we are with African hunting. Same, same deal with him. He, he went there and felt something and spent the rest of his life trying to explain and share what that yeah. feeling was. And that's what we, we've been doing endlessly since, uh, yeah. since we had that experience. Well, I'm, I'm sure all, all these so. experiences, like you think the ones that he had, like two different wars, yeah. um, reporting on them, being involved, mm. being injured, being in, big game, in Spain. Big game fishing. Big game, yeah, yeah which forget yeah. about that. And, you know, being in Key West and then like, how fucking cool have your own boat and Thompson machine gun and you go out after U-boats yeah. every day. And, and uh, you know, he... Uh, you know, in the earlier part of his life when he was in Paris in his 20s, in the 20s, yeah. um, you know, he was soaking up the, the cultural part of that. He had that experience with the painters and the writers and the poets and, and the philosophers and all of that. And then he went out into the world and he ended up and he kept moving to these places that were the frontiers of, of the time. We think of Key West now. Well, Key West, you know, you wouldn't say is, is, a, is a particularly like frontier type town, although it is. But then that was the edge of the world. And then when that became too... Still a very interesting place. Still a very interesting <laughs> place. But when that became kind of overblown, he went to Cuba yeah. at that time. And that would have been a pretty remote place. Because he, um, he was in Cuba for like 20 years, wasn't he? Like it was a significant time, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Quite. But well, about like that. A long time. I mean, I they, mean that's a third of his life, really. Um, that, uh, that, I think, was a really special place to him. Yeah. He, he loved Cuba and then kind of got a little more into the cultural but side. He loved the Cuban people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, everything I've read about and watched, and, and then, too, he could be anywhere he wanted, and he chose to be there. Yeah. Um, because, and he stayed, too. Like, r didn't he, like, right until the end? Like, he leaves the house, and I think the house, it's a, is it a museum now in Cuba? Yes. The, um, and, and all of his shit's still in there. Yeah, the, uh, the Cuban government... Um, has been was always very uh, I, don't, I don't know sympathetic to Ernest Hemingway. They mm -hmm. kind of considered him a you know, and he's kind of co-opted into he's a friend of the state, which wasn't uh, totally accurate. But um, they've been um, very kind of uh, courteous of the estate there. They've maintained it. Um, there's several organizations that oh, they do nice. they do the maintenance. There's there's scholars that go out there. He brought a lot of attention to Cuba um, while he was it's, there. It's actually there's two American flags that fly in Cuba 
and one is at the American Embassy, and the other one is on the Pilar, his boat really? uh, there that they've they've kept there. That's awesome. Um, well, he he because didn't he stay until right the very end? Like he left, and within a mm-hmm. couple of days, like Castro, like they he, took the house. He left when they left. They didn't know they would never go back. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I guess that's why. Is so all there's there's stuff's there's there. you know newspapers over the arm of the chair. His, they, his glasses and toothbrush. Yeah. And so they, they've, they've tried to kind of maintain that. And it's been so long, you know, probably it's pretty close to the way it was. Um, but, uh, y- you know, the government's been been cool. They, they allowed us um, several decades ago to remove a lot of the art that was hung in that house. He had um, quite valuable art collection. Mm-hmm. Um, and we replaced them with replicas and things because the, uh, the environment was harsh on, on oil paintings after, yeah. you know, 80 years. So. That's um, interesting. So we, we've got a good relationship with them. Because then he, he from there he went to Idaho, correct? And then he yes. was only in Idaho for a year or two. Yeah, a couple, a couple of years, um, having terrible terrible health problems. Then um, starting to tr- kind of treat some of his psychological ailments that were catching up to him, and um, and like we were talking about, he he looked much older than he was. Yeah. Um, when he died, he was in his early sixties. He looked like he was eighty. Yeah. Um, just, just, uh, I won't say hard living, but you know, he, he was fairly careful. Oh, he yeah. had fun. I mean, but he wasn't, um, destructive, I'd say to himself. Um, he was actually a very disciplined and regimental kind of person. Um, his, you know, he didn't drink when he was writing and he wrote in the morning, get up early and write, write all morning and maybe then start drinking. Yeah. Um, you know, he wrote longhand, he wrote with a pencil, um, standing up. Um, crazy. He didn't use typewriters for for writing as much for for his uh, huh. prose and stuff. He'd write letters on a typewriter. Um, I think um, there's actually there's only one book that he wrote on a typewriter, a movable feast, um, which was kind of created by some other things that he yeah. found and put together and edited with a typewriter. Um, so yeah, so, so such th- an interesting. There's misconceptions line. about it. Um, but he he wouldn't have produced the body of work that he did. Um if he was this raging drunk. It would be difficult. It, or Yeah, or it'd be, it'd be, maybe, actually, maybe he's a pro. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Um, but, I mean, you know how it is. Someone's polarizing and you want to focus on certain things. If you love them, you focus on certain things. If you want to yeah. be critical, you, other, but I mean, he's a man, he's flawed, so what? Yeah, so. Like, he, he, I mean, he did something that's still, you know, 100 years later in, in, we're, we're still talking about it. Yeah. yeah, it's still, I mean, people are still going to Africa who, kn- who don't know anything about us. People are going there with that book that's in right. their bag. Um, and uh, so to me, that's that's very cool. And so when in our work, we're trying to find ways to, to kind of allow people to celebrate that connection. Yeah. Um, because, because it's writing like, okay, I, I, if, I'm a, if I'm a fan and I adore Ernest Hemingway, the only way I'm going to get to experience life like he did is to write. And that's not necessarily true. Um, writing writing is damned hard. Let me let me tell you. And it's not for everybody. Well, I think it's like most things. Writing is easy unless you want to be really good at it. Yeah, well, I, I suppose <laughs> that's that's, that's it's true. It's really hard. But uh, point being, there are we we've found there's other ways to kind of um, engage with this Hemingway lifestyle or ethos or philosophy um, outside of writing. And that's mostly you know living a thoughtful life, living. Um, an adventurous life. Um, you, yeah, I, I just know, think a passionate about, one. A, yeah. As I've met you and understand uh, like what the family does and trying to do, it's like all these things. Number one, it's just like an awesome name. Like Hemingway is such a cool name, anyway. And um, but what a life that he he led, and how do you you, you know like have Hemingway? guns and Hemingway boats and Hemingway trucks yeah you know all of these things it seems uh, like there's great opportunity for you guys to incorporate it and it does seem like it's good timing like you know our, our country maybe the world's ready for some more of that and not just to be books or videos or interviews that you guys give yeah um and you know it's it's uh, it's, it's a thin line right because I, I get taken to task by people for like the licensing stuff where they we um you know, we, we have a rum company that we work with. Yeah. And how dare you put this Nobel Prize winning author's name on a rum bottle? And, um, you know, some some of this stuff will... I, the answer is we're trying to... Um, for, first of all, we're very proud of that. 
and and you know he'd dig it. He would dig being on a rum bottle. He'd, he he'd, wouldn't. He'd really get a kick out of that. Um, so we we're trying to create things like when when you want to go to Africa and have an experience like Hemingway. So you bring the rifle that he brought. I you, mean, you, you know. Yeah, that, you you think like this is a Griffin and Howe rifle so, that I purchased and. Um, you know, before you and I had met and I only bought this gun because of the legacy and the fact that Griffin and Hal built a gun almost exactly like this for Hemingway for his hunts in Africa. Yeah. And, and to me, otherwise, like, why do I give a shit about an 03 Springfield, you know, converted it's, to a hunting it's, rifle? It's exa- so it's, it's more like it's a, it's a, um, it's a talisman. It's something that gets you a little closer to what he would have experienced so if you're if you're you know if you're fishing for merlin or something and you're drinking rum with his name on it you can kind of feel like you're a little you're a little bit closer to to what made that magical and you can and our hope the family's hope is that that kind of shit is what inspires people to go further to take that upon themselves i mean Um, i i hope i've said it a hundred times but i i I mean your great-grandfather and roosevelt like inspiring me so much mm -hmm. for adventure and hunting but, you know, I would even say, and like, what what the fuck do I know? But in, in what I've read, the understanding that I have about Africa and some other things now, he was probably even born a little too late. He felt that way. That's, I, that's I, what, I mean, yeah. I could see it. I mean, you think about, like, he wanted to go to war. He wanted to write about it. He wanted to fight fascists. He, he wanted to, like, I got a boat. We're in Key West. So I'll go out and look for, like, um, you know, yeah. German subs. Like, hey, I got a Thompson machine gun. Fuck those guys. I mean, just like all these cool things that he wanted to do and experience and that he actually did, didn't just talk about it. Yeah, I and mean, then it yeah. was great. I mean, because I'm sure there's been, you know, for every Hemingway, there's probably 100 guys that went and did these things. But, you know, when there wasn't social media, how is it documented? Mm-hmm. And, you know, at least he had the, you know, the the foresight to to write about it and to want to, exp- and, you know, that he had the talent to be able to express it in a way that people would engage and enjoy mm-hmm. and that they teach it in school now. And these are oh, yeah. these are readings, you know, yeah, uh, it's, it, it, it's it, awesome all around. the You know, most ninth graders in this country will read Old Man in the Sea, yeah, yeah um, I did. which which is probably not the one to start. A fourteen-year-old no. kid, <laughs> because well, <laughs> Make to that reading. point, when I read it, I was like, I don't care about this. Yeah. But then it's it's like kind of dry, right? Yeah. And then now I'm like, oh, I want to read all. But it's it's cool that what you guys are doing, because and it's cool to see this kind of resurgence of uh, Hemingway's popularity, because we've had the the Hunter S. Thompsons and, and a little bit different, but like for a while, like all these things yeah, that you just said, like naughtier. right? <laughs> no, for sure. But all these things you just said, where it's like. He, he just had he these things. Cool. He, he had these cool ideas that he wanted to do, and he went and did them. And like Hunter S. Thompson was that for a while, but now you see another another side of it, a little more tame side of it, oh. um, but just pure adventure. You know, uh, Hemingway was inspired, became interested in going African hunting because of Roosevelt. Oh, really? Um, oh, that that's he a, makes me happy. That's a that's a big deal, and that's what actually what led to the 1903 for Hemingway, also. Um, but. Um, which is another long story, but then Hunter Thompson is a huge Hemingway fan, right? And and used to write about copying Old Man in the Sea and the typewriter, to, hmm. so that he would know what it felt like to write a, that story, write a story like that. Um, Interesting. That's crazy. So he, you know, he uh, just was li- okay. Same same thing. Like I'm trying to describe. We, I think, um, guys like us, people like us, men and women like us, who who like cool shit and and doing interesting things and and living an adventurous and thoughtful life um we are inspired by this kind of stuff um uh, so it, it's cool so to see those guys who, who take it and make it a part of themselves and then hunter thompson went out and led a crazy ass adventurous life yeah um you know a little little bit wilder than Hemingway yeah. did w- um w- wouldn't it be cool like you're wearing a poncho shirt which is a really cool brand but it's like I need like Hemingway hunting clothes with Aerob- like a pocket for Abercrombie my flask. Fitch, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Abercrombie yeah, Fitch, yeah, probably what he was wearing. Yeah, that, uh, um, so we'll we'll see. But we, you know, I don't want to make stuff that is is really lame. Or, no, or, it should be awesome. It's it's um you know j- just do cool stuff that um you know my uh, my grand 
my granddad used to talk about like his kind of barometer for licensing, which, and he wasn't really interested in developing it very far when he was working for the family, um, was kind of like, would, would my dad like this? And, uh, for a while he's, he's like, you know, we were looking at, maybe we'll do a beer, a beer. He's like, my dad liked beer. He's like, He'd get a kick out of that. But you know, um, now it's, it it's, n- now it's just going to be, I think a lot of maybe somewhat educated guessing in what you take from it because yeah. uh, like he, he died before you were born mm-hmm. and you're fortunate to have your grandfather who, who's really old dude now and tell you these stories and was close to him. But like once he's gone, like all you have is is kind of what's documented and how it's documented. Mm-hmm. And then you have your interpretation, but you know I don't I don't just a grand scheme of not someone that knows him, but's inspired by some of his adventure and work. It's like well, you know, he did all this awesome and cool shit. So he, I don't know. I mean, like you could pick well, things that would be like just incredible. And and I've tried to 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 that end. Um, tried to help tell some stories because I like to, I like telling stories and um, I wanted to uh, pick out some of those things and, and crystallize them, save, save these stories because yeah. I didn't want them to die. I didn't want them to go away and, and have uh, the wrong record left behind. Um, like the, the U-boat thing that we were talking about the whole, the yeah. whole summer they spent chasing submarines. Um, that's how I, I kickstarted my writing career was I wanted to, correct that story because I'd, I'd hear about it and be like oh yeah the drunks out there pretending they're hunting submarines and I go man that doesn't mesh with the stories my granddad was telling me about when he was on the boat with him doing that um so I you know went to interview him to to rewrite this story and you know we're going to publish this story um oh, that's so cool with with uh, from his perspective um, yeah because I told you I don't know if you guys know this but Amy at work you know she's half Cuban mm-hmm. and her grandfather was one of his best friends and during that time was um the first mate who allegedly is uh who the old man of the sea is written about yeah gregorio fuentes yeah amy sent me a picture of them together oh, that's crazy. like in some of the other people on the boat and it's like a polaroid with all the handwritten stuff and she's like this was one of my grandfather's best friends in the 50s you know, and, and, and all, and he was That's nice. it, Hemingway's like first mate on the boat and who he wrote the story about. It's and, like, and Jesus. that, that kind of stuff, we encounter these funny connections, um, as, as, I, as I go through this, cause it, we think about it like almost like it happened a really long time ago and it, and it did longer and longer ago all the time, but it wasn't that far back. No. So there's still living people who have connections, right. uh, to it. So that, that's kind of fun. And from my, my high level view of all this stuff, um, I get to see so many parts and pieces of stories and anecdotes and experiences, and I can help put them together for people. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I can shed light on stuff. Other times people ask me like, Hey, you know, I, um, my great aunt tells the story every Christmas when she's drinking about Ernest Hemingway was in her wedding and they had an affair in the coat room. Can you verify this? And I said, how can, how can I verify? Absolutely. <laughs> um, or, or when I was in um, Western Uganda uh, near the, plane crash site where, where he had his uh, mm. series of plane crashes in Africa. And um, I was in a bar and somebody said, Hey, there's a guy who comes in here all the time, swears he has the propeller from that plane crash. Why don't we get him down here and you can tell us if it's the propeller. And, and I'm like, you know, I'm a teenager. I'm like, well, I'm not an aeronautical engineer. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but fuck it. Let's get him down here. Let's check it out. You know, <laughs> let's, let's see listen. what we can do. Um, so I, I meet scholars and things who have dedicated their lives to understanding this material better than I ever will. And they'll ask me questions and, and I, I don't know, I'm learning it with everybody else, but I'll, I'll never know everything about it, it. It is so interesting to think about like his writing is incredible, but let's say we don't know, maybe it's junk, like whatever, but that there you can go on YouTube and there's just hundreds of scholars that yeah. have dedicated much of their life to his writings you know maybe some others but maybe he's one of five but it it, it made such an impact even in other countries oh, you know man, where it's not even their first language and it's translated that they dedicated a t- and it's not like one or two people i mean you know way better than me but it's like hundreds of scholars that have dedicated a great portion oh, of yeah. their adult life to studying someone else's writing and you know that's um, incredible what's uh one, one thing like semi related to that it's interesting to me is uh his his appeal like i said people pick out different yeah. things that appeal to him like 
he is hugely popular on an international level for being a distinctly American writer. And um, the the Russians love him. They love that he's a strong, really? masculine type. Um, oh. the, the the Chinese love him. The, mm. um, Indians love him all through Europe. The um, Scandinavians um, they love his sensitivity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you know it. There's some. There's a little bit of something for everybody in there, and when you look at the big picture, he he does emerge as quite quite an interesting person, um, which I guess is why is why we're still talking about him. Yeah. Um, uh, so that war that That's war cool. on him that that role that was hard on him to live up to that. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I could see that. Um, I mean, it's fascinating. Well, man, I am so glad you visited. And um, I, I just wish you you and your family so much luck with this. And I hope it just continues to, you know, go on. You guys discover new things about him. And, you know, it just continues to be printed and the stories told. Because it's made, like, I'm a pretty fortunate guy. And I've had a pretty great life. And it's, you know, like, the stories of his life are something that are very inspiring to me. Just like Roosevelt's. Yeah. And, you know, like everybody needs to know. And, and, and I tell you, he could have been full of shit about a lot of things. But one thing I can verify is his writings about Africa. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're yeah. right. No, he yeah. probably did, we, didn't we can, have we the ability confirm, to express yeah, it. As, as best as he could, we can confirm that he, <sighs> he, he and I mean. He was so right. I went to Africa. I ended up in Africa because of that book that was written 85 years ago. Um. It's crazy. And and yeah, so yeah. so thank no, thank you for the opportunity to be out here and talk to you guys about it. I'm um, so excited. I'm actually looking at a plane in Africa now to buy to make my travels around southern Africa much faster so I can get more stuff. You're done. not crazy about that drive anymore? <laughs> no, nah, the drive sucks. But Rad and I were driving back from Mozambique and I said, Hey, I want to get a plane and Rad's actually a pilot and mm-hmm. he knows a, a broker over there and everything. He's like, All right, you sure I'll kinda and I was like, yeah, you know, Rad's pretty superstitious. I don't know if you, you know this, but Thomas, you probably remember, like, there's things about the truck or you do things. He's like, don't say that or don't do that. It's like, yeah. what are you, superstitious? And he's like, so on the drive, the guy finds a couple of planes and is, like, sending us pictures mm-hmm. and details. And he's like, oh, look how beautiful. This one's just been, you know, refurbished and just painted. And I was like, man, that's awesome. And knowing Rad was superstitious, I was like, Cause he's like, we'll put the Q logo right there, and I was like, never mind that. We're gonna name it the Hemingway. He's like, why would you say that? <laughs> you know, that's what um, when when we when we were there, we were thinking about going to the the um, Kamas camp and yeah. and um, talking about the logistics, yeah, and pipe pulling everybody lives. in the, yeah into a plane and going up there. And some somebody's comment, I think it was Jason, was like, do we really want to get on a plane with a Hemingway in Africa? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>